Activate defenses. Activate defenses. Commence countdown. Ten minutes and counting. Nine minutes and counting. Eight minutes and counting. Seven minutes and counting. Six minutes and counting. Five minutes and counting. Four minutes and counting. Three minutes and counting. Two minutes and counting. One minute and counting. Forty seconds and counting. Hello, David Zeritsky for the Bond Experience. Welcome back. All right, you know how we do these types of things. The first and foremost is I need to know if everybody hears me. It's not the sexiest way to start a book club. I get it, but it is a practical way. It's really important that you hear the voices that are going to be coming to you through this YouTube channel. And once we can establish that, we're going to have some fun. And I promised some new technology. Some of you may have seen this before. Um, and great, Wuta, you now have said that you can hear me. And by the way, I'm showing something right away. Um, we now have the technology to show your comments and questions right in the video itself. Yes, you become a part of the immersive action. That's, that's just how we roll. So please, throughout this whole thing, this isn't going to work without your comments your cajoles, your questions. We want to get all of that. So for example, John Lennon is hearing me in Ireland. John, thank you so much and, and welcome from Ireland. But listen, I could wax on about technology. That's not really what you're here for. Let us officially start the James Bond Book Club and for your eyes only. Okay, enough pomp and circumstance. If you are here for your eyes only, uh, you've come to the right place. Let's start out with some of the basics. First of all, this is a book club. What is a book club? It's where we can talk every opinion matters. And there's going to be different opinions, especially with five stories. And by the way, I've been aptly corrected. This isn't for your eyes only the novel. This is for your eyes only the anthology, the short stories. And so I felt very compelled to choose five co-hosts, each one of them for 30 minutes covering a different one of the stories. And it's really, I think it's gonna be something very special. Part of the book club is that we have a drink or two. Yeah, you have a libation, you relax, it's, it's Saturday, we're amongst friends in the community here. So let me tell you what I've done, all right? Uh, I'll start out with my drink, but everybody, I want you to kind of list, if you are having a drink, list it in the chat room. I've got a steel flask. Now, just knowing that I have a steel flask, knowing this short stories, what do you think is in my steel flask? Anybody? If you guessed bourbon, specifically uh, three quarters bourbon to a quarter coffee, then uh, then you guessed right. So this is this is going to be my drink, at least for now. I do have a backup if, if I go through this, but that'll be some drink. And it isn't an ice cold flask and an appropriate one. I have some snacks because I get a little hungry. This is going to be three hours long. So, hey, Adriano 17, there is nothing wrong with drinking milk. You do you. You do you. And, and milk can give you a hangover, so be careful. Um, I also, right from the book, have some olives and some cashews because – when he was eating that in the uh, cafe, it just made me hungry. But you know what also makes me hungry? Getting the next person in here, the next co-host, to really begin with the very first story. So without further ado, everybody, welcome Melanie to the show. Hello. How are you? I'm doing great. I, uh, I have with me my libation here. Uh, for anyone who's been to New Orleans, I know. <laughs> I am, uh, even though I've been living in the D.C. area since uh, 2005, uh, you can take the girl out of Louisiana. You cannot take the Louisiana girl out of the girl. Uh, so I've got a uh, Powder Brian's Hurricane. So. Uh, listen, I absolutely love that. And by the way, 
first of all, we have to start. Melanie, we know you have an Instagram, uh, but quite frankly, people insisted that you come back. You oh. were a huge hit when you were on the last show because people were like, she knows her onions. Like she, and and it was fantastic. And of course you're in, in trivia rooms and quiz shows and you know, you do things with other people, but honestly, you've become a bit of a fan favorite. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. I love hearing that. Thanks everyone. It's true. It's true. And by the way, if you get through that libation, um, <laughs> do you have paramedics on the side? Because that thing was like, I, I, I will be sticking around for the uh, end wrap up discussion. So we'll see. I might, the smile might be even bigger by then. <laughs> and I've got to agree with Fletcher. Your, uh, your energy is just infectious. So I couldn't think of somebody better to start this off, but let me, let me just roll back for everybody dialing in a little bit about this anthology, because I don't know if a lot of people know that this, it was published in 1960, for 15 shillings, what a bargain. But it didn't always start off with Ian Fleming building these out. These, these, these were really put together specifically for TV shows, at least four out of the five of them, I'm sure you know. Um, adaptions for plots of television, CBS had, had hired Ian Fleming to do James Bond TV shows based on the success of the television show from Climax, the Casino Royale one. They said, this was great, let's do more of these. And then CBS canceled his contract. So he said, I'm just going to put this in an anthology of stories. Um, do, you, do you know the history behind it? Uh, yeah, I've heard a little bit about it. You know, one thing that I would love to do that I have not done yet is actually read a biography about Ian Fleming, uh, which I haven't done. So that's on my, uh, I, I figure after we finish reading all the Fleming novels for the Fleming Reading Challenge, yeah. maybe we should work in a biography. <laughs> there's there's a um, a novel called Goldeneye, and it really does talk about the history of Fleming, some of his writing, some of his lovers, his trysts, and things like that. So it's definitely one that you want to pick up. But it was great. I mean, he and, and some of the people when I was in Jamaica told me this, he needed to tack on one more story, and he built that last story at Goldeneye. He put them all together, and it was interesting. The very first name was not for your eyes only. It was, and I got this down here, five secret occasions in the life of James Bond. Boy, that just rolls off your tongue. And then when it went to the US, they called it five secret exploits of James Bond. But I like that they went down to for, for, for your eyes only. Yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And you know, I think all of these, all of these stories, they work so well on their own. But couldn't you see this uh, being woven all together uh, to an entire novel, you know? It's, it's amazing like that. Um, and let's start it off with something very basic. First of all, you're doing From a View to a Kill. What did you think of the story? I, I think this is the perfect way to kick off this collection. Yeah. Um, this is... you. You'd mentioned that these were written for TV. You could see this being a television pilot, 100%. Yeah. Uh, I love this story. Uh, you see more of the cinematic bond. Uh, I love the espionage elements of it, uh, the excitement with the motorcycle chase, the hits of danger. Um, you know, I uh, love... I love, I actually, I really love Marianne. Uh, I, I like that she ends up coming to the rescue at the end. There's a little bit of romance there, but it has really strong Avengers vibes Ooh. to it. Oh, I like huge, that. Huge, huge Avengers vibes. And yeah. and this is, this is amazing because, I mean, these are the happy accidents I think we're going to be talking about for the next few hours because the reality is, is that good friends of Fleming, people that observed him, actually said that he was at, his weariness, his actual limit of self-doubt when he was writing this. Now, they said it like an insult, but I think it actually adds to the flavor of this. I mean, the best artists are, they're, they're labored. You know, they've got issues. And I think that's what you're talking about in, in kind of feeling here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I, it, I think it would work great for a television pilot. Uh, like I said, you could see Emma Peel coming to the rescue of Steed in this. You could see like the weird contraption, the flower opening up, uh, the rose bush parting. It, it definitely feels uh, like TV. But one of the things that I liked is you still see Fleming 
in these short stories. And it's something that I've mentioned before. He really, uh, I know you've shared a lot about like the hidden bond moments that yeah. we experience, but I think Fleming puts in hidden moments as well. He, he uses a lot of heavy symbolism, birds, flowers, uh, luck is one of the themes we keep seeing over and over again. And you mm. see this heavily even throughout these short stories. So he's still giving us that, those little moments, those hidden moments that we have to search for. I, I agree. By the way, a lot of a lot of agreement on Avengers. And that, that's really introspective. I di didn't even think of that. There are so many things washing over with me. And I have to tell you, I'm guilty of something with these five stories. When I started reading them, I, I it was hard for me to make the transition of a short story James Bond adventure, which does really move very smoothly and very quickly, just like a TV show. They felt like TV shows. But then transferring that to all of the description of a villain, all the description of lifestyle that he puts in his actual books, I was kind of missing that. But I agree, From a View to a Kill has a nice beginning because it feels like a Bond adventure. Yeah, I definitely miss the character development. And I think Marianne Russell is a great example of that. Yeah. We don't get as much of her as we get uh, as far as the, like if we're looking back at Tiffany Case or uh, you know some of the other Bond girls that we've had, Solitaire, throughout the novel, Vesper. I mean, uh, that's something that you do lack. You don't get as much of that. But yeah. as far as descriptions go, I do think he still packs in some good descriptions, even in these short mm -hmm. stories. Uh, and one great example of this is um, I follow an account on Instagram uh, from Shetland with Love, and he did this fantastic video where he took Google Earth and he did the street views oh, of okay. uh, the motorcycle chase. Oh, that's and cool. It's, and it's so cool to actually see that. And when you read it, you can really picture it. So. Absolutely amazing. I love that. It, it's um, Tim Hans has a really good point. He says the main plot to the From a View to a Kill short story would make a terrific movie PTS. And I agree. Don't know why they haven't attempted it yet. It is. It's, it's really fun. And I think a lot of people don't realize that that story was actually going to be the descriptor for Drax. When they were having Moonraker and things like that, they were going to have that whole opening as a description, and he wound up cutting it out and then bringing it back for this story, which is fascinating to me. Yeah. yeah. What do you think of the... I always like to think about the characters in these stories. You, you already said kind of the women character may not be the, the strongest until the end, maybe. Um, but what did you think of Bond in this? How was the portrayal of the character? You don't get that. You don't get as much of him. And again, it's the difference between a short story and a novel. You still have some of his thought process, the whole um, fantasy that he has about the French women, mm -hmm. uh, some of his uh, thoughts when he's uh, staking in, like in the stakeout, yeah. uh, waiting for something to happen. You get a degree of that, but it definitely, you know, that's something that you're really missing in this, I feel. I, I I agree. And it was interesting that there's so much description around the periscope, you know, the whole flower aspect. I thought that was genius. But there were some things that, you know, you really didn't get to flesh out the character. I almost felt, and when we get to the end, we talk about the reviews, what the critics thought at the time. It'll be an interesting discussion. But I felt that if this was somebody's first Bond novel stories, they'd come up a little short as far as Bond the character. What do you think? You know, um, I think we get little teasers of him mm. throughout all of the short stories. So I think when you put all five of them together, uh, you definitely get a better feel of him. But um, I know uh, Chris will be talking later about Hildebrand. Yeah. But if you were to pick up a Playboy and read that, <laughs> which that's where it was first published, right. would you really get a feeling of who Bond was? You know, no, I don't probably think you would. <laughs> probably not. <No. laughs> yeah, but and when you put them all together, you you get a good feel of that, and uh, and you brought up the rose, uh, and I'm going to go back to that because that's something that I really I love this aspect of it is you still get Fleming, you still have the same themes that run throughout, the same symbols. We see roses, I mean, from all of the books that you've covered in the past, 
heavy, heavy symbolism. Whenever there's a danger present, we always see a rose. Whenever there's, you know, someone who's not as it seems, uh, you know, and the same thing with these bird symbols, he's including them. He's, he's weaving them throughout all the short stories. And I love that he kept that. He kept the themes. We don't get uh, as deep of a look into the characters, but I feel like he's, he stayed true to his writing style. And what I've got to get through my head, and I, I should have done this more when I was reading it, is these were supposed to be TV shows for the public. You know, these weren't novels to be read at the beach or over a whiskey. And, you know, so you couldn't get too deep into the characters for a quickly digestible TV show. So, for example, um, Not Perfected Yet, who does really good reviews, by the way, of all the books. They're, they're fantastic. It says, Marianne Russell may be the most forgettable female character Fleming wrote, but it's nice that she doesn't have the usual abusive past like many others. So maybe this was just to insert a female character for that one moment at the end and then out. I mean, what do you think about that? I, you know, 100%. I, I agree. Uh, you know, I think keeping in mind that these were, were supposed to be TV shows, you know, uh, you have yeah. the end at the of every episode ends the same way. I figure it's like, you know, Seinfeld at the end of every episode, he's up in front of the brick wall doing his stand up, right? At the end of all of these, Bond is going to be in a hotel or kissing some different woman each time. So yeah. I don't think the woman, unfortunately, now, even though these are strong women, you know, she comes in and saves the day, but I, they're secondary. Yeah, and when we talk a little bit about the history, you know, how Fleming was motivated, let's use that word, to write some of these stories, especially when we get to like Quantum of Solace, it's very interesting because Fleming seemed to be very influenced in positive ways and negative ways at the time by women, a lot of women, not just his wife. So I think this was, you know, he's always been, seems like the type of writer, he puts his emotions and what he's going through, his beliefs on the page. And I think we were getting some of that. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, he's, uh, he, he uses a lot of religious references throughout his writing. Yeah. Uh, we get luck. He, he talks about luck so heavily. And when you do think about the actual spy game, Mm. how much luck really does play into that. It makes sense that we see that, uh, you talked about his relationship with women, Um, I was having a conversation with someone and uh, they brought up that uh, his mother's name was Rose. I believe that was her maiden name, perhaps. And that that could be one of the reasons that we keep seeing this Rose symbolism throughout the books. Yeah, you're you're in good company. Alex Lamas nailed it, too. His mother, (laughs) his mother keeps coming up. It's like Salvador, you know, uh, Dolly. And his, you know, his nanny. It's these things that just keep coming up. By the way, I've got to tell you, Melanie, coffee with a lot of bourbon is delicious. Oh, I was not expecting that. (laughs) And because it's warm out, I I made it ice cold. So it's like an, it's like an ice coffee bourbon. Have you taken a sip of your drink yet? I did. I actually did. I'll take another. So cheers. Oh my gosh. Cheers. Cheers. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming. Of oh my course. gosh. No, good good <laughs> points. People are people are making a lot of good comments and you know, we do we do want to give a little bit of flavor here because for each one of these we've been kind of putting this little theme of, you know, movie, book, you know, story. Uh Eddie for example says frankly I think the movies were a lot better. He might be talking about novels as a whole. Um but was there anything in this particular short story that connected back to A View to a Kill, the movie, <laughs> other than being in Paris. I, 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 don't, I don't think I could connect a single thing. I mean, we were talking about how uh, Marianne Russell is sort of a weaker woman, and then you look at the movie A View to a Kill, and you've got Grace Jones's May Day, who's, uh, I'm, I, I'm not, she's one of my favorite characters in the Bond franchise. I love yes. her. <laughs> and yeah. so, I mean, you know, but as far as comparing this particular short story to a film, you would really be stretching. I'm hard pressed. I'd love to hear in the chat room if anybody has caught anything other than the Parisian aspect to it. And it's interesting, you know, everybody's saying that this, the woman in this story, besides the kick ass ending, um, was relatively a little weak on the writing, whereas Mayday is some of people's favorite character in that film. Uh, By the way, Calvin, you're right. This is like a a Red Bull um, 
It's a classy vodka Red Bull. I'll take that. Believe me. And I love this from Shane Mackey. Mel would make a great host and bartender. Her drinks always look great. Oh, thanks, Shane. <laughs> Cheers. She's, she's always so put together. I don't even try to dress up on these anymore because I find my co-hosts just do a much better job at it. Oh, thanks, just David. The reality. <laughs> um, when you're done reading this short story, number one, does it feel complete to you? Does it feel like a complete adventure, beginning, middle, and then? Is it wanting more? I mean, what was the what I call the aftertaste? Uh, you know, it's. It, I feel as though. If, if you were reading, like we mentioned this earlier, if, you're, if you pick up a magazine mm -hmm. and were to read a Bond adventure, I feel like this one would be a great teaser in a magazine. Yeah. You know, if I went through and read this, I'd get a good taste. It would make me hungry to read uh, Fleming's novels to get yeah. more. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's exciting. I feel like it has all of the elements, really, of yeah. our cinematic Bond that we're used to. And when I finish and get to the end of this, I am ready for more. More. What's Ooh. the next adventure? What's the next mission? I like Let's. That. Yeah. <laughs> this is like a, a tease to hook you. Actually, um, I think Marcel agrees with you. He says, you know, yeah, motorcycle chase. I agree that motorcycle chase was it was tense. I was actually nervous for Bond when he was doing it. I'm like, how is he going to fare any better than the next person? It 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 was a tense couple of scenes. And I love the investigative Bond too. Yes. Yeah, those because we don't see that in the new James Bond movies anymore. You don't see the, you know, the from Russia with love, creeping around corners, slowness. And the movies, you know, kind of don't don't take their time as often as they did. And then you have controversial statements like this, which are gonna just piss people off. <laughs> Alex Lama says, please, please. I can almost hear him saying this. This book was far better than the movie of you to a kill, but you really can't compare them. What? I, I I don't think you can. Can you? No, no. And and I will defend uh, the movie of You to a Kill till the day I die because I love it. I think it's and just so much And that's when Melanie, fun. everybody, will have to say. <laughs> oh, you know, there is a bond for everyone. There is a bond movie for everyone. Yes, uh, just I not like that one. It's no, oh. That's <laughs> and, and, I, and a part of this too is I think I'm going to have a very different perspective than you will just, uh, you know, a, a male versus female perspective, hmm. because I do love Mayday. I love her story. Yeah, I, I love Grace Jones as a little girl. I mean, that was something that I gravitated towards. I wanted to be like her. She lifts a man over her head. <laughs> Like, <laughs> I, I know that's true. It's a little crazy. By the way, I I can you ever you ever hear an eye roll in something that somebody posts? Joe Hahn says the thrilling cinematic sequence of Bond staking out a field in a tree all day. I oh. get it. I but it, you know I I find that the Bond novels allow you to have those slow, more measurable moments, and I appreciate those. What about you? Yeah, you can do that in a book better than you can a movie because you have the characters, you're seeing inside their thoughts, their head. And that's something so difficult to translate to the screen. Ah, uh, Calvin. <laughs> yeah, this is this is where I lose control. And now it turns into the Melanie show. And that I'm actually okay with that. Um, and then you've got people that get very distracted. It is a Saturday and people are drinking. Like Joe Darlington that says, I love when she bites Zorn. And I don't think she means you. I think he's talking about May Day. Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> Possibly. You Aww. know, I, I have to go back to Fleming for a second because one of the things I think discussing these short stories does, it, it celebrates Fleming. Uh, Fleming has foibles. We all have foibles. You know, fallibility. Um, there's issues to talk about in a lot of these stories and books, and we shouldn't be afraid of those. What I, what I was finding very interesting is Fleming really uses – all of his experiences, all those impact moments in his life to write his books. For example, the idea of the underground hideout, he said, was from his brother, Peter. His auxiliary units dug tunnels in Britain in 1940 as part of the resistance movement. And he wanted to kind of show that off. And it was interesting. And Melanie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a little psychology game with you. You didn't know this was coming. Uh-oh. <laughs> the original name that Fleming has for this story is called The Rough with the smooth. Why do you think he was going to call it that? 
And you can play in the game, you can play in the chat room this. The rough with the smooth. You know, I, he's in the rough. Hmm. We see that. We see hmm. him actually in the rough. And I right. think the smooth would just be Bond himself. You know, he is hmm. a cool cat. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, you have teams of people out there with dogs and they're sniffing the area and they don't, they come up with nothing. And you have Bond who comes in and solves everything, you know, stakes, it goes into the rough. Oh, of course, gypsies. Uh, you know, this is, um, you know, a total spy move that, that, that little hint of the invisible man mm -hmm. uh, that's referenced. Uh, and I mean, I, I think you get that when, uh, in real life, when you talk about uh, changing looks yeah. uh, as yeah. spies, you know, uh, that, that, that element of espionage, he is smooth. Uh, he goes into the rough. He solves it all. So I, I, that's what I'm walking away with from that original title. So Patrick would agree with you. Bond is a little rough around the edges, and he's smooth as silk on the job. I, I'm asking you not because I have an answer. I'm asking you because I think it's almost like a Rorschach test or a piece of art. I think it's very subjective to the reader. You know, I took it as, and this is because I guess I'm trained well nowadays, um, you know, Bond was maybe the rough, but it was the the smoothness, you know, actually the femme fatale that, you know, saves his bacon in the end. And so it was his way of, you know, dare I say, in 1958 Fleming, celebrating women. Is that even possible? Now, of course, he, he unredeems himself. God, that's not a word. This is why I don't write. Um, you know, by putting some other interesting 1958 terminology in there. But it's, I don't know, it's, it's interesting because there's a lot of different ideas in the chat room, but everybody I think is gravitating to yours. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she does. She said she helps smooth things over in the end. So that's a good interpretation as well. <laughs> Absolutely. What other observations would you say of the, of this short story that you kind of wanted to get across? You know, I, I loved, I, one of the things that I really do love is that at the very beginning of this bond has had a failed mission. And that could be mm. another element of that rough that we haven't discussed. And that's something that we very rarely ever get to see from Bond. Yeah. Is a failed mission. So I, that part, when I very when I read this for the first time, that actually really excited me. And I wanted to hear more about it because it is something totally new. Unless you have the Daniel Craig films where he fails every mission. But you're right. I mean, the books, the books, he's usually a celebratory hero. Oh, I'm going to get hate mail for that. Um, but but you're right. Yes. And, you know, again, it maybe goes back to Fleming's weariness. You know, he wasn't making the heroic bond or, or the Dr. No Bond is a superhero. He's fighting giant squids for the love of God. But this one is sitting in a cafe. He's staring out. He's daydreaming about women, but he's not really acting on women. A woman approaches him, mm -hmm. not the other way around. He's not chatting up a woman. He's the recept. He's a receptor of that. And oh, I love that theory. And, By the way, and even that he snaps out of that dream so quickly too. He's picturing it all out in his head, and he's like, "Yeah, that'll never happen." Yeah, <laughs> like you do see a defeated Bond. You're right. You're right. By the way, I've got to tell you something with your story. I was going to have a Negroni for this or an Americano and Danielle drinks them all the time. And she made one last night. She goes, you should try it first. And I've tried it a long time ago. And that's why I'm drinking bourbon and coffee. <laughs> that's why I have a hurricane. <laughs> it's an acquired taste. Um, this is interesting. Look at this. The rough could have been his stakeout compared to the smooth of sitting outside a Paris cafe environment. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, so, Melanie, this is what I'm going to do to kind of end your part of the session. And it's a tough one because I'm not, you know, you, you have a disadvantage. You're the first one. You know, Dr. Lisa Funnel is watching the whole thing from the green room so she can make notes, of course. Um, she's, you know, probably like this in the green room back there knowing her. But here's the reality. I'd like you, after having read all the other stories, I assume you read the whole anthology. Yes. Where would you put this story versus the others? Your story. I am I am personally not a fan. Uh, I'm glad Chris is on later to defend it. I'm not a fan of Hildebrand. 
Uh, I was, I really wish that they would have ended the collection on a more heroic story. It was such a mm. wah, wah ending for me. It was really a downer. Um, I, I'm not crazy about, I, I like being able to see Fleming's more experimental writings. Yeah. That's kind of, it's fun. Ooh, it's it's yeah. a nice little departure. However, I'm not as big of a fan. I want the hero bond. Um, you know, I, if anything, you read that and you're like, okay, that was nice. Now let's go back to to what we've been doing because this yeah. is more fun. <laughs> so you're you're pretty happy with the story you got. Oh, I 100% am. I think it okay. was a great way to kick it off is. this collection. I do. And it's a great way to kick off this. And we would love you to join us at the end for the afterglow. I don't even know what that means, but I've seen it on uh, agendas for meetings. But uh, would you would you come back and chat with us later? I will be. I cannot wait to hear what all of the other guests have to say about their story. So I'm 100% going to stick around. Well, thank you for doing the most amazing job warming up this group. So thank uh, you. Thank you for having me. Of course. Melanie, we'll see you later. See enjoy you enjoy the M&Ms in the green room. We just got okay. green ones oh, for I, you. Just ooh, green. Nice. Oh, thank you. Well, you asked for green. That was like Oh, it was in demands. my rider in the contract. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> all right. Thank you. We'll see you a little later. All right, that was great. And and like that, we're done with the first story, which is crazy. That thing flew. Um, and by the way, thank you, thank you so much. Everybody in the chat room, you're doing everything right, which is essentially just making sure that um, you're commenting. You know, we want your comments. We want your questions. It makes it so much fun. It gives, you know, the, the, the co-host something to react to. And uh, it's what it's all about. So... That being said, let's go to our next co-host. And mind you, the person that I'm bringing on right now is not only an award-winning author, um, has not only wrote written some incredible books, but she's incredibly, incredibly prolific on social media as well as co-host for a lot of different things. And she launched last year her own successful podcast, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Lisa Funnel to the show. Yay! Hello! <laughs> that was a great intro. I'm I'm so embarrassed. I said Dr. Lisa Funnel, and I didn't say Justice, your puppy galore. <laughs> it's okay. He has treats galore, so he's going to be uh, over my shoulder, hopefully, for the entire segment. I'll try. And, and, and by the way, I've got to say, you know, just justice for like 20 more seconds. The sure. best part is going back and watching these videos afterwards and seeing Justice's reaction. Everything from putting his paw on Lisa's, you know, shoulder to say, nah, mom, not so much, uh, to like <laughs> just looking really bored. He is very expressive and I'm obsessed with everything that he does. If he's happy, sad, bored, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, he just, I'm a big fan of um, adopting dogs and I know that this is not the segment, mm. but no, it's fine. please adopt dogs, foster them, foster fail them. They are amazing and they've done a world of good, at least for me during this pandemic, so. By the way, a fellow author, Roland, writes a, a lot of interesting uh, adventure books that are filled with sensuality and intrigue. Huge fan of Lisa, been reading a lot of her stuff lately. So, oh, oh, fans out there. Interesting. Go to Amazon.com. Damn it. <laughs> we'll post the link below. Uh, Lisa, we've got to talk about your story. I mean, for your eyes only, this is this is a pretty auspicious one. And it's obviously the title of the anthology. Mm -hmm. Let's just kick it off. What did you think? Well, I had the option to pick from the story. So I guess I'm just going to go from what Melanie said. And I picked this one, right? And there's a lot of reasons why. I felt that it was a solid story from beginning, middle to end. It takes me to many different places. I think mm. there's four different countries. There's, you know, death and revenge. And um, you have bond and there's hunting involved and instincts and violence and shootouts. And I'm an action oriented person. Yes. So I don't want something that's like really introspective and that's really deep. I want something that's going to keep me moving through the pages. Although I did listen to this on audiobook to prepare, but it kept me, you know, <laughs> gripped to, I'm just saying, uh, but it did keep me really connected. And I wanted to pay attention instead of stuff that's just so expository that you just lull me to sleep. Yeah. I, by the way, whoops. Um, 
Uh, Horev Dor says the dog looks focused. That's well, that's justice. I mean, you know, <laughs> if we can just keep the attention. So let's get into this. I mean, for yeah. your eyes only, I think this is maybe some of the amongst people's favorite, just because of what you just said. It ticks off an mm -hmm. incredible amount of of boxes for this character and these types of stories. And I, I skipped something that I didn't want to skip too much. Are you having a book club libation right now? So yes, so I know that you went with the fire water that he drinks in this particular one, and I could not handle fire water. Let's put it that way. <laughs> this would be a very different um, uh, book club <laughs> meeting if I was drinking it. So I did come up with, and it's in my Canada glass. It is called a maple amaretto vodka cocktail. The only thing that is added to that would be um, lemon juice. And so in honor of Vaughn going to Canada, and in honor of Canadians, like actually being presented as good characters, we suck in the movies. We're terrible. But here, John's is kind of the hero. He gives Bond his entire mission and the maps, and he's capable and he's confident and he does all the heavy lifting for Bond. I thought, rock on Canada. So I'm I'm honoring Canada, and there's so much maple syrup in this. I'm just saying. I'm going to be chattering a lot because this is this is for people that have a sweet tooth or just Lisa that desperately needs sugar. That's all. <laughs> that is true, and it maple syrup is amazing for you. It's got a lot of health benefits. Just Absolutely, that there. Just, just put it right in your veins. Um, I love this <laughs> from the Gleaner. The Gleaner, and like as in the Jamaica Gleaner, um, for your eyes only, the greatest opening of all the Fleming texts. You've got birds, you've got Jamaica, and everything one could wish for. What did you think of the opening, Lisa? Well, I always think it's because James Bond is named after an ornithologist, anytime there's birds in Ian Fleming's writings, I, I, I see it as being ironic, but I think it's also a testament to Bond. Like that to me represents who James Bond is in a broader sense. I found it interesting that it opened in Jamaica and this is right before Jamaica has its independence. And so you're yes. seeing it as it's going through maybe this process of decolonization and the neighborhoods being taken over you basically see the Havelocks commenting on the changes that are taking place. And as Ian Fleming has lived there, it's probably his perspective as to why things are changing, but he's telling it through the voices of, of the Havelocks. Yeah, it's so true because we, we've talked about in other book clubs how this is a situation where Fleming was really fearful of change. Yeah. And even when I was visiting Jamaica just a few months ago, they still, many people wax fondly about the colonization. You know, there was a revolt, but, you know, people saw what happened after the revolt. And Fleming is a staunch protector. You know, mm -hmm. he feels he's a protector of the realm. And you start to feel this in, in the story, uh, especially around the Havelocks. Yeah. And they are protectors. I mean, it, it, they talk about having their plantation, 300 years, multiple generations gifted to them by a king or royalty of some sort, really positioning them as having roots in this place, even though, I mean, they were the colonizers, but having roots in this place after 300 years and really fighting to keep their, their land, even in the face of danger, even in the face of somebody coming into their home, knowing that there's a threat, feeling the threat. I think um, when the wife, I can't think of what her name is, not Judy's daughter, the wife, whatever her name was, Havelock, she was the one who kept like inching closer. I like the descriptions of inching closer, yeah. um, sort of putting a hand there just through her body language, suggesting that there is danger. She felt it. And the two of them were standing there in the face of change and refusing to, to have that change going forward. And they intended for Judy to take over the land, right? right? That this was something that was going to be gifted to the next generation. Yeah. And, you know, coming after that, the, the story seems to change for me. You know, you've got this horror show that goes on here. And then you have this very close connection with M. And it's yeah. an M that I don't normally see in the other books. It was mm -hmm. a softer Emma. You know, would you do me a favor type M? But what did you think of the, the, the character play here? I really was drawn in by the conversation about leadership. And it's something that I don't think we think about leaders and the roles that they play. And so he talks about the fact that if you keep going up the chain, you're going to get to a certain point where somebody has to make a decision. And he talks about some people throw it up to God, but God kicks it back to me. At the end of the day, I am responsible for the decisions that are made. And I thought just that 
was yeah. so powerful and so reflective of, you know, what leaders do have to go through and the responsibilities and do they abdicate some of those responsibilities or try to cast it aside. And so I really felt connected with what M was saying and going through. Do I use personal like work resources for a personal um, vendetta? And how do I feel? And really trying to like drag Bond in and, and and bait him into being like, fine, I'll go and do it. Even though Bond doesn't really want to be a killer, even yeah. though that's part of his job, he's like, uh, he, he has hesitancy. And I kind of yeah. like the hesitancy that he has. Like he doesn't take killing for granted. I, it, it's, it's that Bond that everybody's talking about throughout. And I think it's going to be shown consistently throughout these stories. It's a very different Bond. Even some of the reviews at the time, people said it's, it's a more mellow. That was the word they used, a more mellow bond. By the way, Heather Green, thank you. There we go. Wife never given a, a first name, just Mrs. Havelock. So I feel like we're <laughs> redeemed, Lisa. What do you think? I was I was like grasping for straws in my memory. I'm like, I don't remember any, like I blanked. And I'm like, mm, usually I get a letter or I get like a sound in a name. Yep. I had nothing. So, so yeah, it wasn't there. Ooh, look at this. Alex Lama says, technically, this was an illegal mission. Mm -hmm. And was asking Bond to commit an assassination. Ooh. Little and don't get caught. That. And don't yeah. get caught. Yeah, th though that little detail. <laughs> so what did you think about? I mean, you know, we've talked a little bit about Bond, but then he goes and obviously into the circumstance, it's almost a little bit like kind of a stakeout. And, and it to me... I was so surprised. I'll, I'll give you my first impressions. I was so surprised. I was so interested because Bond is kind of just moving through grass and observing other people and running into and fighting from afar. Yeah. And I found that there, there are two things that I found really interesting and engaging. First of all, all of his musings. Like if I'm walking through a forest for five miles, my mind is going to drift eventually. And so when he's like, when does a hill become a mountain? And, you know, these birds, like when are they going to turn and not be afraid of man anymore? And, mm. and are they going to attack? And there's a lot of musings that I was just like, these are good questions. I would yeah. probably come up with them myself. So I like the fact that his mind was wandering in a way that I, I found amusing. And then when it comes to bond and hunting, I've always said Bond is a body focused spy, right? He's he's aware. Casino Royale, you open mm. it up. It's all about his body taking a cold shower, having his senses be, you know, uh, uh, like on cue. But in this, it's a step further. He's not in a controlled indoor environment. Yes. He's outdoors. And his knowledge and talking about understanding like branches don't break when it's animals and explaining different sounds and, and moving through in his observations, even before getting the prey that he's hunting. Right. I thought that was like, and again, I'm not an expository person. I find like descriptions really boring, but I was totally into it where I was like, I can see what you're doing because it's, it's still body focused. What, what the storyline was taking us through. I don't want to play Sophie's choice favorites, yeah. but mm -hmm. this is why I like this story slightly better than Melanie's. And the reason is, is because there is that description. I mean, you get the outdoorsy, woodsy James Bond. What? Yeah. That's crazy. He's not the, the suited booted, you know, James Bond. And I, I love that. Um, this is really cool. It, the symbolism of the old motor mowers taking over from the old machines in one of the scenes. It reminds me of the scene in Skyfall in the National Gallery, but that's the detail that Fleming decided to add in here. So do we get less action orientation? We have the big finale, but what we get is so much more. And that is that wonderful Fleming description. I think. Yeah. And, and I think that the action that we do get, we get violence punctuated at the beginning. We have a lot of descriptions and feelings and emotions and character development and travel and movement in many different ways. And then we get the action at the end. And yes. I feel as though it's sort of like a U shape in terms of the action. And normally for me, I'm like, I want to see action and action and action. But with this story, just because it's a short story, it held my attention from start to finish. I, I just feel it's a very well-rounded, well-shaped yeah. story. And I, 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 I'm into all the descriptions in between because I think they make the story. By the way, for those watching, uh, Lisa wrote a book on warrior women and action. Mm -hmm. So it's not that she <laughs> likes it. She's researched it. She's, she's steeped in it. So she has no choice. I get it. All right. I've got to ask the big question, especially with your background and, and your focus, you know, mm -hmm. on social media. Judy, Judy, Judy. What did you think of Judy Havelock? Well, she was the other reason why I picked this story. And here's the thing about Judy. James Bond has everything in many ways handed to him. 
right? He has the map handed to him and the mission handed to him and he is flown to a place and he's told where to stop. And then his, his adventure begins, right? Mm -hmm. Then he starts walking and starts taking his path. Judy is the, the, she's running her own ship. So she discovers her parents. Although in the film, we, we see that moment. We don't actually get to see her inner life in that moment, but I'm sure it's horrific, right? Yeah. We find out from her story that she then travels around, gets information. She does all of that. When Bond asked her for her hunting license, she got her own hunting license. It wasn't something that was given to her. And so she is autonomous on this mission for revenge. And she's not going to take crap from Bond. And like for me as somebody, I don't like it when men call women the B word and Bond kind of punk like peppers that in a couple of times, like beautiful. Say yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it's, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> I just don't want to say it. Okay. Um, but those moments um, where, where you can see him getting frustrated and she holds her own, she's 25. And yet yeah. she's sitting there being like, anticipating his moves like oh yeah you think you're going to go hit me on the back of the head i'm going to go put an arrow in your foot and i'm going to keep going and i think it's the tenacity that she has and the dedication and you know i don't think killing is easy and she's definitely um you can see it on the other side but killing is not supposed to be easy right but yeah. she's somebody who wants it she wants i want to make the shot i want to kill the person who directed the killing of my parents and then just to add to that they killed her horse and her dog like this is John Wick territory for me right now where I'm just like literally just kill them all Melina at this point because if you kill my family if you try to come for my dog you know I will learn how to shoot a bow and arrow there's there's no parlay <laughs> there's no yeah you can't give up that by the way I wow I mean let's unpack that because I just thought she was total badass that she could shoot him in the back from a hundred yards away. People take yep. a beat and think mm -hmm. about how far a hundred yards is. And it's not a crossbow like in the films, which is yeah. arguably more accurate. It's it's a longbow. Yeah. And I just thought, in fact, if you if you noticed when I was doing preheating for this for this day, I put the cover, I found a great, you know, great pan cover of her holding the bow. And I'm like, that's Lisa's cover. That's yep. Lisa's cover. Um but yeah. I thought she was great. I think that the fact that unlike Melina, you know, that kind of had to be like pulled along in the movies, mm -hmm. she was proactive. Judy was proactive. She was on her own. You know, Fleming, you know, had that moment at the end when, you know, the healing yeah. of her, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But I, I thought she was a really fun, action oriented character. And it's interesting because when I read her as someone who teaches and talks about action films, she's very much the, the hunting girl archetype that has been popularized by Katniss Everdeen. So somebody who also knows nature, somebody who uses a bow and arrow, uh, you can kill from a distance, which means you don't have to have the close up violence that takes place, which often requires muscularity. It tends to be, a, it's more personal and it requires a certain level of physical fitness. So you can still stand at a distance be well versed and suited in nature, kill your target, but in many ways maintain your femininity in the process. And so I see a lot of connections there between those types of, of characters. And until the very end, you know, you, where you have sort of the moment and then Bond carries her stuff and takes her to a motel and la, 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. But I know I, what ails you. <laughs> but I did think it was she was a very solid character and Bond's like, well, I have no choice. I have to work with her. And Bond's like, we'll do it this way. She's like, no, we're doing it my way. And they do it her way. And I think that's something that needs to be stressed. Like she's dictating the type of mission. Bond follows along and Bond supports her and trusts her in, in these moments to, to, take, to take the shot, even though he's like, when is she going to take the shot? Yeah. But she takes the shot and she, she hits him. Yeah, just at the last moment. And this was a big moment for Fleming because when Bond takes his shots, ultimately, he's not incredibly accurate. Like, mm -hmm. if you think about the accuracy level of this, and a lot of people in the chat room are saying, a bow from that distance, I mean, you should be hunting buffalo. That's how, you know, skilled she is. Um, this is truly remarkable that Fleming wrote it like this, I think. Yeah, and Bond, through a lot of this, after she takes the shot, is like, hiding and crouching and 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 there's a lot of fire firepower weapons bullets that's the word <laughs> sorry that was the drink <laughs> and bullets coming at him and 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 tree stuff ricocheting everywhere and he has to literally get away from his cover stand up 
point it because he's not familiar with the weapon, which is something that needs to be stressed. This is not his gun. This is yeah. not something that he had been trained to utilize. So now he's shooting without necessarily the experience to use the gun and he has to take a risk. And I think that's something that needs to be emphasized. He puts himself mm. in harm's way, clear shot from the other dude, and then decides to, to shoot and he gets his man eventually. So I think there's the redeeming factor that Fleming's throwing in there is the risk, the personal risk. Do you know, you probably do, but if you don't, I'll tell you. Like, do you what? know the original title Fleming had for this story? I do not. Okay, I think you're going to find it fascinating. And I'm also wondering if he was going to name it this to be ironic, hmm. but it was going to be called Man's Work. <laughs> Which I don't know if he would have chosen it if it was called Man's Work, but it is true. It was going to be called Man's Work, uh, taking place in Vermont, uh, he had a friend, Ivar, uh, who had an incredible farm there, and he was going to put all this in there. And uh, he was also going to leave it, uh, I think he was going to call it Death Leaves an Echo, you know, because of the valley yeah. situation, which would have been cool. I, I would like that one. But man's work you're not going for. Look no, up. I mean, this idea that, you know, only spies can be men and killing is like a man's thing and like, yeah. no. Yeah, but, for your, <laughs> but he didn't. And now he did for your eyes only, and it's so much better. Can I talk about that for a second? Please. One of my favorite parts, so we've got the whole conversation between Bond and M, right? Right. My favorite part is he takes out the folder, he takes out the stamp, and I'm thinking, like, I love stamps. Like, why did we ever get away from paper? I want to go back to stamping. I like things that are tangible. And it's red ink. He does the for your eyes only, and it's still liquid when he's handing it to Bond. And to me, this is an assassination. This is murder for hire, however we want to frame it. But the red ink to me reminds me of like blood and and, and, and sort of its gooiness. And it takes a while for mm. that to solidify. And so I've always found that to be almost my favorite part is just the imagery that goes with it. It's not necessarily the in the movie, it's 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 Melina Havelock's eyes that were like, yeah. ooh, for your eyes only. Um, or her comment at the end, but instead it really is the dossier that is being handed. And it's like, almost like it's stamped in blood. Love the imagery there. I didn't even pick that up. Thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> no, really that that's crazy. That's going to haunt me. Uh, Lisa, I'd like you to take a sip of your drink and I'll tell you why. Oh, okay. We have to move to, there are similarities mm -hmm. between the book and the movie, which ones did you pick up? It's like a, it's like a fine Waldo moment. So there are a bunch. So you have the Havelocks and the Havelocks. Havelocks in Jamaica, Havelocks in Greece, and you can't have them because of the changing of sovereignty. It wouldn't make sense to have them be in Jamaica. So you can understand the shift to Greece. You have birds in both of them. You have uh, Judy is driving a sports car, which I thought was really cool because. Melina drives that yellow Citroen, there's a word. With the a Citroen, C. yeah. Citroen, however you say it, which is sort of like this Citroen. dumpy car. It's like a funny, weird car instead of a sports car. So I thought that that really took away from her. We've got a bow and arrow and a crossbow. Crossbow scares me a lot more than a bow and arrow. I'm just throwing that out there. Oh, yeah, it's powerful. Um, you have the two of them meeting in sort of on in the bush, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, although in the short story, that's the end of the story versus right. everything else. And just to tie it into, oh, is it Risco where you have um, Christados and Colum Risico. Yeah, Colombo. Yeah. Yeah. You have like their thing that's thrown into this one. Yes. So I think that there's that connection, which I'm sure you'll talk about later but like it's interesting that like you have this short story collection and then whoever uh was putting the script together for this decided i want to take some of this but ooh, this is really interesting let's combine it with some of the best stuff of this particular story and you put it together and it it, it, it for me it works i think it's interesting i agree and you've got you know obviously the murder the revenge aspect like you're talking about to me when i was reading this it was interesting i went in this it's been forever since I read this anthology. And I remember saying to myself, I'm going to really be on the lookout, but pretty relaxed about it for those movie moments. It screamed to me as soon as they said mm -hmm. the Havelocks. I'm like, the Havelocks, of course. And then the parrot in the movie. You know, I'm like, oh, birds. And maybe that's the nod to the birds and things like that. So 
I do think, and I love the fact that For Your Eyes Only, which is one of my favorite Roger films, just because it, it takes itself seriously, yeah. clearly used these short stories as a, as a basis. And do you think, I don't know the answer, because when you talk to people about James Bond fandom and you talk to them about favorite films, there's some of the basics in there. But oftentimes it's this notion of like, you want to talk about people who like are really well versed, you ask them about For Your Eyes Only. Like that tends to be, for people who are very serious about Bond, it tends to make it there on their list because it is a serious film. And I'm wondering if the consideration of, or it's valuing is due to the way that it's adapted from the short story, if fans are making mm. that connection or if they simply just like it because it's more of a serious film. And I don't know the answer, um, but I've always been interested in the ways that the novels and the films connect. If I was to put money on it, I would say the the majority percentage is because of the seriousness of the, of the movie. Because a lot of us, like many people on this uh, thread, they've discovered the stories for the first time. Mm -hmm. But um, this, this is interesting. Question. We like action films. Do we think the filmmakers chose a crossbow due to the popularity of Chewie in Star Wars? If they did, I would love that fact. I want this to be true. I feel like I'm David Duchovny. Like, I want to believe. Yes. <laughs> Let this be true. Yes, I and hope we, so. Do we have enough people, even if you're watching this after the fact, a month after recording this, could we start that rumor? Can we get Wikipedia <laughs> to change that to fact? Oh, I, I want just, this I just to be want true. A yeah. um, couple people are saying that the villain uh, in the movie was better than the villains. And I think that's just because there's only so much time to really do Julian Glover versus, you know, Hammerstein, which you just get a view of. Yeah, I, it's a snapshot of him. And of course they're pulling, what well, wasn't Hammerstein, former Nazi? Was that, am I making this up? No, I, you're not. So, so actually <laughs> von Hammerstein, uh, General uh, was taken from General Baron Kurt von Hammerstein Accord. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six words in his name. And he was one, actually one of Hitler's opponents as opposed to allies. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know what that. <laughs> so, like, what, would people at the moment, because again, we're thinking post war, you know, still having those feelings going, would audiences have made that difference, that mm. differentiation? And also, I found it really interesting when they were talking about Fidel. Castro. They were talking about Castro a lot yes. coming into power and like being supportive of Castro coming into power and kind of like cleaning up the regime and Bond seems to be in favor. And I think M is also in favor if my memory serves yeah, me. Yeah, very good. Right. So yeah. are you right? <laughs> there's, there's a lot of discussion about that. It's fascinating. And seeing just the perspective at the time. And sometimes when we think about history, I don't want to say hindsight's 2020, but we kind of change our minds on how we think about things after the fact and we see how history goes. It would be interesting to know, like, is this was this a contemporaneous viewpoint that this is a good thing? And then maybe afterwards to the United States and geopolitics stuff, it becomes more of a negative. Hmm. Um, I don't that I don't know. This is the heavy stuff that I love. <laughs> uh, so, so Lisa, I'm going to go all psychology on you, but you've got a hint and you were going like this behind the scenes in the green <laughs> room. We, well, we've got a camera in the green room. I know it's, uh, it's a little disturbing, uh, but I'm going to ask you before reading this, you raised your hand and you wanted this story. You wanted yeah. this story after reading it. Where do you put it, you know, against some of the other stories? Is it still your favorite? Yeah. <laughs> Great. I, I picked it for Canada. I picked it for Judy Havelock. I picked it for, you know, just having other characters other than Bond who are doing really well, which is something you don't get in the films. This is more of yeah. a comparison to, to the world of the films. I did like A View to a Kill short story because, again, I felt it was also action oriented. I did find it interesting. Both of them, he's hunting, though he's in the blind there. Yeah. Um, and I felt it was a little bit the mechanized thing underground felt a little futuristic to me, but sure, they were both very action oriented and I, I was right. very much leaning into it. And I like the fact that women did stuff in it. Um, yeah, they and, and, and that's important to me, but I, I still would put this ab above um, because I think that overall, I think women are represented a lot better in this one, just well-rounded with, with a couple comments from Bond getting frustrated here and there. If we were to hear read 
um, Judy Havelock's inner monologue, I'd love to read what she was thinking <laughs> and the words that she was choosing because we don't get her perspective. We only get his. Um, but I think she holds her own. And I think to me, this is just more of a story that's palatable to me compared to all the other ones. Okay. No, I like that. I like that. Well, first of all, thank you for your perspective on this and coming back. Now, I, you know, eagle-eyed individuals probably realized we did lose justice during this. Justice oh, lost. Justice. Come here, baby. Come on. Oh, oh, is he, oh he just went south for the winter. Hang okay. On. I said, Here we hello. Go. Justice, you, you can were finish good. like this. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> Dr. Lisa Funnel, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Always, always <laughs> so informative and wonderful. And, and just thanks so much. You're welcome. We'll talk to you later, okay? Cheers. All right. Well, that was great. And boom, just like that. I'm telling you, this is this is uh like clockwork. I'm gonna I'm gonna have some cashews. I'm I'm sitting in a Parisian cafe. I get the munchies. I can get really close and do, um, no, that's going to be disturbing. By the way, there are some sounds that are just very relaxing. That's not going to be one of them. I hope everybody's doing good. A lot of people saying, um, thanks, Lisa. Loved her. Morgan. Lisa's always phenomenal with that. Um, Justice can get a little cranky. No, Justice is fantastic. Um, everybody's saying, thank you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this has been so much fun. You know, it's unbelievable. It's four o'clock and we've got three more stories and some weird thing I keep calling afterglow. It's amazing. Luckily, I've got some more bourbon and coffee. That's going to be a good thing. So why don't we do this? I just talked about sounds and I did that for a reason. My next co-host who's coming on to talk about uh, the next story is actually make some very interesting sounds on her social media. And it's usually the sounds of scissors cutting fabric. What do I even mean by that? Everybody, let's welcome Elma to the show. Elma, hello. <laughs> Hi, I didn't think you were gonna mention my scissors this time. <laughs> your scissors, first of all, I love your background. And Thank folks, you. that's not a fake background, that's a real background, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I just put the records up like yesterday, trying to prepare for this actually. So Elma is 50% of the Dress to Kill podcast, which I, I not only listened to voraciously, they were honored and foolish enough to have me as a guest. <laughs> yeah. Is that correct? We had, yes, we had so much fun. You were an amazing guest and we got to talk about all of the fashion and your collection. And yeah, it was great having you. It was it was so much fun for me, and I think the I think the podcast is up, and I think there's a, a YouTube video coming in the future, which will be yes. really fun. We're working Ooh. on it. Yeah, <laughs> love it. And by the way, the reason I mentioned scissors, and you can probably see over Elma's left hand shoulder, um, you have your own business called Elma Lingerie, and yes. you design, create, and make lingerie. I do. Yes, exactly. Um, I do handmade lingerie for women who have a hard time finding their own size. So I do a lot of bespoke work. I cater to petite women with smaller chests. And that's basically my whole uh, mission is to give people, um, women who are looking for lingerie who can never fit it, um, something to wear. So let's take a beat, everybody. How cool is this? We've got <laughs> Elma, who who does that creative aspect and runs her own company, but she also has this incredible podcast, which is just so personable. Oh, and by the way, a monster James Bond fan. So that's why we had to have you on the show. <laughs> yes, um, but I will confess, I am a fan of the movies first and foremost, and so the books are still. I'm still in the discovery stage. I read a handful of them. Um, but this one, the one that you proposed to us to read this time is actually one that I have read before. So, <laughs> yes. yeah. All right. So, so do you have a libation? I have a couple. <laughs> yes. So a couple. Um, I have, I well, I have that. my coffee. I needed my coffee cause it's still, um, just 1 PM here in California, but I also just poured a glass of McAllen since in the story, they're drinking some whiskey, telling the yes. story. Um, and just, just to have a little bit of the taste in my mouth, I'm not going to well, try to, to drink up. <laughs> Cheers. By the way, um, I knew this about Elma. She is a whiskey drinker. McKellen, what? 12, 15, 21? 12. 
Yes. <laughs> it's it's a go-to. I mean, it's so delicious. I actually like it better than the 15. Oh, yeah. I know. I it's crazy. Don't get a chance to drink the 15 too often, so I can't re really compare, but yeah. <laughs> By the way, create channels like woohoo, Quantum of Solace. Uh, the good news is for many of you, this is not about the uh, this is not about the movie, <laughs> which I know is a very divisive conversation. <laughs> All right, is is Alana on this? Look at this, dress it, to kill pod. Yeah, hi, hi Alana, hi Alana. She's amazing. Yeah, she um, is. So talk to me. How long had it been since you've read Quantum of Solace the story? Actually, um, I think I read it last, the first time I picked it up, which was in 2017, I was at just a, a small like used bookshop in Seattle and happened to come across this book because I, I, and I hadn't seen this version. This is actually the one that has all of the short story collections. So it includes the rest of them, but I only read the For Your Eyes Only collective. Right. And, um, and it, so it had been a few years since I read it and I forgot um, I mean, I remembered that this the story stuck with me because it was so different. Um, it's not an action thriller. It's he's not on a mission. It re it doesn't even feature Bond that much, but it was so relatable. And it's a story about humanity. It's it's um, you know about relationships and love and being cheated on and hurt. And there's aspects of that that most of us can relate to, even if it hasn't happened to us. You hear about stories. Um, and so for that reason, I chose, I had the luxury of choosing which story I wanted to talk about. And that's why I picked Quantum. I think it's a great pick. And it's interesting the way you started out describing it. To me, out of probably any of the stories, this was the story that really seemed like Fleming getting something off his chest. I mean, oh, this, yeah. right? I mean, it just, it, as I'm reading all of this and, you know, <laughs> So it's it's the 1950s, and you know Fleming is probably the giver and maybe even the receiver of abuse or mm -hmm. you know things that happen. Like you said, it happens to every one of us. You're not a human being if you're having just a plateau of goodness. Mm -hmm. Bad things happen, and to me, this was his way of telling a story. But it's also not an obvious Bond story. There is okay. no motorcycles and periscopes and arrows going into people's backs. It's basically, let's sit down and chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, like you said, it's exactly that. It's a moment to kind of sit and take a step back from all of the action that he experiences. And and this story falls right in between um, the five. It's right in the middle of the five short stories, right? So yeah. it feels like an intermission. It's kind yeah. of a break, a little breather. Um, he's in between jobs and there's no traveling around the world and all the exciting things that happen in the previous in the previous stories. And it it really it's gives you a step, um, it kind of gives you an insight into what Bond is thinking as an observer, you yeah. know, looking, observing this relationship that's crumbling and being engaged in this story that's being told to him. And um, and I think like for that reason and that aspect is kind of the most interesting and insightful telling telling about Bond. You know, Absolutely. like Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. What all right. So this is this is going to be a very unfair question. So prepare yourself. You may have to have some more McKellen. <laughs> what did you think about Bond as a character here? Because for me, he was almost like again a receiver. He was ancillary to the actual core of the story. But what did you think about Bond and all of this? Yeah, it, interesting. So when I came back to read it for this book club, it was, I'll be, I'll be honest, it was a little bit of a struggle trying to synthesize and formulate my thoughts and opinions on this because, um, you know, first you're just being told this story about Rhoda and Philip and you're like, what does this have to do with Bond? Like, how right. am I gonna relate it to anything? But there's those moments when he, um, the governor pulls out of the story and you know he's lighting his cigar and um, he's pouring another drink and Bond adds his little commentary about how um, what an awful you know how awful she is or what you know it sucks that this had to happen to him and you get this idea that oh actually Bond must this must be the thing that he fears the most is heartbreak and falling in love and then being heartbroken you know, because he says it's so awful and it's um, compared to his, like his missions and stuff that he does and facing death every single day, this was actually the true violence. And 
you know, it, it's, it tells you that that's actually what he fears the most. Yeah. And, and some of the, the, the comments that I just put up here are exactly what you're saying, supporting it is that, you know, when we talk about some of these, especially the short stories being TV shows, right? This one doesn't seem like that. This one seems like this is 30, 30 pages of character description. I mean, you're finding the littlest thing. I mean, I really, I got the whole sense when Rhoda was going around and, and flirting and, you know, seeing the other uh, uh, young gentleman from the other family, you could almost weave out of prose the pain, you know, yes. that he was yeah. feeling and you could get a sense of who she is. It was almost a, um, a bit of a cliche of who she was being, but it's a cliche now. I don't think it was a cliche back in the fifties. I don't know. Yeah, sure. And it's, it's interesting because, well, you said it was written for TV. Was this one also written for TV to begin with? So I, I this was, I'll, I'll tell you quickly the history that I know of this. And by the way, everybody, the great thing is we have hundreds of people in the chat room that can correct me. But um, what I do know about this is, is that Blanche Blackwell, who was a neighbor of Ian Fleming and Chris Blackwell's mother, um, who now owns, Chris owns Goldeneye now, Blanche was a friend and lover of Ian mm -hmm. Fleming. And that's public, by the way. Um, but it was actually a story that she told Ian Fleming about a, a police inspector. Mm -hmm. And so this was his way of actually saying, uh, I'd like to write a story that Blanche told me. I believe that this story was for, ready for this? I think it was for Cosmopolitan Magazine. Yes, it was. Okay, yes. <laughs> Yes, Redeemed. and um, and I thought that was also interesting because it's you know a love story um, about this woman that cheats on um, a newly married husband and and then his revenge on her and um, and I wrote down that quote that was written in the Cosmo as the header. It says, "Marriage can survive every disaster but one, the one that can never be forgiven." Had Rhoda given her husband a quantum of solace, he wouldn't have exacted the cruelest revenge of all. And that immediately hooks you, you know, if you start yeah. looking at Cosmopolitan magazine and if you're thinking about the the readers of, you know, Cosmo in 1959, I am imagining like the marvelous Miss Maisel type housewives of, um, you know, the 1950s. Yeah. And there's this exciting um, story in the book and in, in the magazine about, you know, like we'll find out what's it, what it's about and um, about cheating and um, and things like that. But but I was asking if it was, you know, related to any TV show or anything either, because I think this story could become a full-fledged novel. Like if if uh, mm. Fleming had wanted to expand on it, I think, and like you said, it was he was getting something off of his chest. He yeah. has also been um, been cheated on and has cheated on his wife, and they, you know, they had with his his wife Anne, they had a whole uh, tumultuous relationship, and like you said, Blanche was kind of. Um, his muse and his um, yeah. his lover, but I feel like if he wanted to, he could have totally written a whole book and just delved deeper into the characters of this. Because what you don't get in the short, um, you know, it's thirty pages or so. Yeah. What you don't get in this short story is her perspective, and you know, Dr. Lisa also mentioned that about her story too. You often yeah. miss like the female perspective, but. Like there's always two sides to a relationship story. And, you know, the way that the governor is telling the story, you can sense judgment from his side. And um, and they're really painting her as the villain. And yes, of course, it's horrible how she um, how she cheated on him and how she didn't even care or to try to hide it or anything. But, you know, people cheat because of there, there's a reason why people cheat. They're yeah. lacking something in there's their a relationship. Gap in their life, yeah. Yes, and yeah. you know he tried to make her happy by getting her a gramophone and then getting her golf lessons, and you know that wasn't the point. She was missing something, and that I would love to hear more and I, like explore on. Okay, it's just you and I. No one else is on this, so <laughs> I could tell you this. I I actually felt bad for Rhoda. When she was going to return the TV and someone in the car and everything like that. And there's, there's an old saying, um, and it, it could be taken two different ways. It's called putting a hundred on 10. And what that is, is if someone nicks you with a knife, it's taking a bazooka and blowing them away. And it, in other words, it's doing much more damage than they did to you. 
So, you know, yes, the husband was cheated on. It was humiliating and all these different things. And obviously it caused his demise psychologically too. I mean, it really eroded the man away. Yes. But he really did a number two to the point where Rhoda, you know, I, I almost got the sense from Bond's point of view that Rhoda is not Rhoda anymore yeah. when she's with the this new guy because yeah. she's boring now. She's not this vivacious <laughs> individual. So in a way, her personality was destroyed. Yes. I mean, yes. Like she she did what she did and he, um, traumatized Philip for life. And, you know, he was scarred and he, it, it was crazy how much he, you know, like reading this because it's based on a true story that Blanche told. You're like, yeah. wow, this is actually happening to real people. But it's crazy how much he hated her enough to do all the things that he did. And it's awful how he lays out, you know, he comes back from Washington and you must, and I was thinking he must have been like on the flight back or like the two weeks that he was away. He oh, must yeah. have been just really like um, raging underneath and thinking yeah. about how can I destroy this woman's life and how can I be as mean as possible and like just letting all that stew while yeah. he's, you know, separated from her. And then he comes back and tells her very plainly, this is the arrangement. Um, you get the bedroom, you get the kitchen, you can't come to any of the other parts of the house. You can, if you want to talk to me, you have to leave notes in the bathroom, but this is the last time we're ever going to speak. He doesn't even give her a chance to talk back or say anything or rebut. Yeah. And it's, it's you, like in an instant, you feel sorry for her. Yeah. Because just before that, you were like, you were on Philip's side when she's saying, oh, when he comes back, I'm going to, you know get teary eyed and say apology, all the apologies. Yeah. And I promise this won't happen again and all the things. And you're like, oh, this manipulative woman. And, mm -hmm. and, and then he just throws down the hammer and you're like, oh my God, I feel so bad for her now. Yeah. It, the emotions really do switch. And yeah. I think it's very successful. By the way, Roland, um, I've had this up for like 10 minutes. Uh, Roland, <laughs> who, who interestingly is an author of, um, very uh, action-oriented, but very sensual books about relationships and things like that, says colonials during that period were always bed hopping and getting into scandals. My parents mm. used to tell me some wild stories from the people they knew living in Kenya in the 1960s. So he knows what he's talking about. He's a he's a colony man himself. So that's kind of interesting. But I I tend to agree with you. I think this, this story, which um, frankly, I was going into thinking to myself, now, is this the story where it's just a story? There isn't a lot of action. I kind of went into it like, all right, here we go. But I really wound up enjoying it because it is so introspective. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah, same. I also really loved it. And the more I, I read it a couple times this time around, and then I also listened to the audiobook while I was just like cooking and doing my daily things. But the more I listen to it, the more layers I discover. And, you know, there's the aspect where you can look at the story that's being told by the governor of um, of the crumbling relationship. And then you pull out and then there's the part about Bond and how he's reacting to this. And, and then you think like, um, because it's moved him so much, this story, oh, does he think about, are these things that he considers, you know, humanity and relationships and and emotions when he's on his missions and doing his other things? And and then you think on another level, like, oh, what would I have done if I was in this relationship? And, you know, it's like I was saying earlier, it's very relatable. Like, yeah. you start out disliking these characters, you and then you start to feel sympathy or pity first. You're like, oh, I feel so bad for these people. Why do they keep doing the things that they do? Just stop. And then you feel sympathy because it's awful how he treats her and then yeah. or both ways. And then you're like, okay, well, what what would I do? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's it's not a happy ending. It's not a heroic or joyous ending. And by the way, let's let's get deep for a second because the chat room is um, Money Penny observes that Rhoda is Greek for Rose, uh -huh. Ian Fleming's mother. So right. is it another, you know, uh, Oedipus, you know, type <laughs> of situation or Freudian thing? And then this is really good. I love this. Heather says, love turns to hate much yeah. easier than turning to indifference. Oh, interesting. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And you really feel the hate that he had yeah. for her in this. And, um, you know, the, the relationship starts out um, really quickly. Like he, I think he, it was only like a month and then they got married. 
Um, and then within six months, she was um, unfaithful to him. And then, and then the revenge aspect, though. So that was, you know, the whole the relationship. And then the revenge yeah. aspect lasted a whole ye- another year, you know, and it was a torturous year of just so long. Yeah, it's crazy oh of gosh. just being um, basically a captive to Philip. And, you know, they still had to put on the show that they were a happily married couple. She couldn't really talk about this with anyone. (sighs) She, you know, was given like 20 pounds a month to do house cleaning chore or like housekeeping. And that's it. And and by the end of it, all she was left with was her furs, her jewelry, a gramophone and a car, which the last two had debts and you know, and she doesn't find that out until she's going to return them to like sell them off. And then he's like, oh, actually you owe 200, 200 pounds on this. It's like just the longest prolonged- It's torture. torture. It's torture, it's psychological yeah. torture. Elma, I can tell by your body language, you're getting mad. You know, <laughs> I, I do find that hate leads to anger and anger leads, <laughs> anger to, leads suffering. to suffering. Oh, yes. Damn it. <laughs> yes, I thought that was gonna be so unique, but no, of course it wasn't. <laughs> By the way, really good, um, and I just lost it. Of course I did. Um, in the chat room. Oh, here we go. No, that was not obviously the, the conversation. But basically somebody was um, talking about Quantum of Solace. We have to actually talk about the aspect of the movie versus the title. Because I know during when the movie premiered, there was a quote by Daniel Craig where he said, well, you know, Quantum of Solace is about you know, not having this one aspect and not even having the slightest thing. And it was, it didn't quite factor back to the movie. Mm. I mean, the the organization was quantum, but um, did you notice any movie correlation at all besides the title? So it's interesting. Well, no, but I thought it was interesting that they chose to use this title after Casino Royale. So after he had fallen in love and been heartbroken and now this story is about, and then Quantum becomes a story about, re- the movie becomes a story about revenge. And they chose to use the name Quantum of Solace from the short story, which is also about revenge and being heartbroken. That's basically the only connection, but uh, yeah, it's That's it pretty much cool. it, right? Quantum but I love, <laughs> I love, I love the description in the short story of Quantum of Solace because, mm-hmm. you know, it is so identifiable. This is a really great point, um, not perfected yet, says, deliberately leaving Rhoda with a debt was, was such a cold move that I couldn't think Philip capable at the beginning. This was a story about arcs and not necessarily positive arcs, but yeah. Philip being this, you know, she walks on water to I'm going to destroy her very life to Rhoda going for this lively, you know, life of the party, vivacious individual to somebody who is just potentially spent. Um, it really is a very, to me, this is the most realistic Fleming story that he's ever written. Yes. And that's also why I like this because if I'm not a huge reader, I'll be honest, but if I do, I like to read um, nonfiction. And this feels like just a true story about, you know, a couple and the going through heartbreak and revenge and the, like, you know, the um, person in the comment said, Philip, Yes, he was so destroyed by what what she had done to him that he his arc just went like this. And he, basically, he's also destroyed himself by you know exacting such what a, that kind of a revenge on her. Yeah. Like I think the governor said, like he never really recovered from it. He lost a bit of humanity in his work afterwards. Yeah, it'll change you, um, but you can't. <laughs> and this is just me like putting my opinion on him, yeah, but like sure. you, you can't, that revenge is not the answer. You can't move forward and like become, you know, thrive after that. Um, yeah. It's, what do they it's say? Not- an eye for an eye and everybody will be blind in the world. I mean, Alex <laughs> sure. Lamas here says, not sure if Fleming knew much about Zen, but you know, Quantum of Solace was a story of karma. However, yeah. I think it was also a story of no matter how much revenge you get, no matter how much you think is going to satisfy you, yeah. it will actually consume and destroy you. Philip, to me, was also destroyed by his own revenge. Exactly. That yeah. was my takeaway. Yes. Yes. I'm still going to get revenge on people, though, Alma. <laughs> no, no, of no. course you will. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. It's 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 um, it's 
kind of lets you appreciate what you have too, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I love this story because I get, I love studying relationships and I've been in a long relationship myself. And this is just kind of, um, you know, gives you those warning signs. Like this is not the way to behave if you want uh, to be happy in life. Yeah. So you stopped all those bad habits as soon as you read this story? <laughs> yeah. As soon as I read it. <laughs> Flipped 180 degrees and you're yeah. like, this book good. changed me. <laughs> like By the way, that's, that's going to be, yeah, that's going to be in the, the cliff note. And this book changed me. It, it just did. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to ask you the question that I've been asking everybody else. And it's a tough question, but, you know, after reading this, I assume you read the other stories. Mm -hmm. What did you think of your story versus the other? Is it still your favorite? Um, is it just so different than the others? What, what were your thoughts on that? Yes. So it was so hard to pick um, because when you first asked me, there were still a few, most of the other stories were available mm -hmm. and I was really teetering on the first three. Um, so of you to a kill and for your eyes, I love they're full of action and adventure. You got a girl on a motorcycle. There's um, a girl with a cross, I mean, not a crossbow, a longbow. Yeah. But then I was like, I think this is the one that I want to talk about because it's about relationships. Um, and then, like I said, I once I started reading it, I was like, oh, shit. I, oh, excuse me. Did I pick the wrong story? Because it was so hard. Everybody to... put the kids to bed because Alma's <laughs> going to be swearing, obviously. No, I'm so sorry. Um, but okay. yes, so... So I was like, dang, this is really hard to kind of synthesize this. But I actually fell a lot more in love with this um, this story as I was reading it. And I would highly recommend it to anyone who hasn't read it. Um, just look at it as a as Bond as the observer. It's not about mm -hmm. him. It's really not. It's about you you all you learn about Bond is how what he thinks about relationships, his take on what's hum human, humane, you know, and humanity. Yeah. Um, and that I think is pretty insightful. So I really enjoyed it this time. And um, yeah, I think that um, I still really like this one. Can I, I have a confession to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just you and I, so why not? Um, when you were assigned this and I read this story, I was so happy that you had it, and I'll tell you why, your podcast, I, I've always said this to you, your podcast is a celebration of the Bond franchise, but there are also these parable-like moments of observation. So although you love everything about the Bond franchise, you also talk about some things uh, that you feel about it. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just about clothing, but you know, some of the takeaways of Bond himself, Bond through the ages, um, relationships, and I thought, oh, this is so perfect because you and you and Alana really do thrive on discussing all that and adding color to those moments. Yes, we love like analyzing characters and um, it's the psychology of it and why people are doing what they do, what drove them to these decisions, you know, like with Philip and Rhoda. I just kept saying, well, don't, why don't do that? Stop doing that. You guys can better stop or it's you're just going to ruin your lives. Um, but all of that is so fascinating and yeah. it's because it's, you know, kind of relatable. You think about it, how does it apply to you? Whereas the action adventure stuff, it's fun to look at it, um, from the outside, but I can't, I don't really see myself like, you know, shooting men in the back with longbows. <laughs> and, um, have you tried it? <laughs> no, not, yet, not yet. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And and this story, actually, while I was reading it, I was thinking, if they turned it into a movie, how could they have done it? And and I think it would actually have been cool if back then, if um, Alfred Hitchcock maybe directed it and interpreted it as you know a love revenge story because he's so good at that suspense. Yes. And I know he has, you know, he was approached to do some Bond stuff early on. Yeah. Um, but this would have been a great story for him to do, I think. And how cool would it have been like in the 60s setting? Also? I agree. And I like your idea. Although I like a really good adventure romp, I kind of would have liked Fleming to flesh this out as a novel. Like exactly. I think this, I mean, there's so many different, and by the way, you could have, yeah, it, it definitely would be a different flavor. It would be like, you know, James Bond in New York. I don't know if you ever read that, mm -hmm. but it's like, it, it talks about New York and it's got like a, a sprinkling of James Bond, but I think I'd be okay with that actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that would be great. Like if he, you know, 
I'm sure he has all his life, Fleming has his life experiences that he can pour into this, into this story um, and really flesh it out. It would have, it would be fascinating. It would have been fascinating to read that. Right, Maybe some totally. continuation novel list will yes. <laughs> work on that. That would be very cool. Get like Raymond Benson or somebody yes, to work exactly. on that. Yes, exactly. That's right? what I was thinking. <laughs> By the way, um, I, too many to actually post. I have people applauding your swearing. So <laughs> who knew? And by the way, your podcast, it's, it's, I, I, I think I said side boob and you're like, it's okay, David, you can say <laughs> side boob. You were very gentle with me with that. Yeah. Anything goes on our podcast. <laughs> so you can swear on my show. It's totally fine. <laughs> Are you going to join us at the end? Yes. I'll be here with my drink. <laughs> yes. You, it looks like you need a refill. Put, 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 put. <laughs> I'll top it up for, uh, for the end. Yeah. Elma, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank this you so great. much. This was a really exciting, fun, new thing for me to do. So thank you. You're great. Yeah. Unbelievable. I'll let you go drink in the uh, in the green room. Okay. Stay away from uh, Justice, the uh, puppy galore, though. <laughs> you get a little honorary. Okay. Thank Take you. Care. That was great. That was great. And your comments are amazing, everybody. They are phenomenal. I'm just going to have some water. This is uh, water and some lemon. Look, it's a branding moment with the wrong date. Yay me. All right. Hope everybody's doing well. It is 430. I mean, this is this is like this is like army. Like, I cannot believe we are so on time. Um, I am so excited for two reasons. This next story is definitely one of my favorites, Rosico. And on top of this, this person is one of my favorite people because she has done an amazing job galvanizing the Bond community. I love the word galvanizing because she tends to get gals together. And yes, Jocelyn, you can use that if you want. Ladies and gentlemen from Ladies Who Bond, Jocelyn, welcome. Hi. Did you like that? Oh yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. It's quite an honor. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, I, the honor's all mine. How are you today? I, I'm doing great. Thank you very much. That's a cool chair. That looks a little like a Blofeld chair. Yeah, it's it's um my husband's chair. <laughs> I'm in his office, so. He did a good job picking that out. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, like I said in the send up, uh, you know, your social channels have been so great. They're so inspirational. Um, you could see people love you. License to Thrill. Hi, Jocelyn. Jocelyn Woot. <laughs> Lloyd Nance. Hi, Jocelyn. Uh, I mean, just people are just going crazy. It's the Jocelyn show now. I'm fine. I've believe me, I gave up this show when Melanie came on. So I'm I'm totally fine giving it all up. Uh, I will say that I'm so happy you picked this one because I think it's a really strong story. But speaking of strong, are you having anything to drink tonight? Yes. So I am having an, an Alexandra. Oh, that's in the uh, that's in the book. It is in the book, so it's it's the drink that Cristados has. Um, Perfect. I know What's in it? Like it's um, okay. So in the book, it's described as vodka and cream, but the recipe I went with is gin, um, a clear creme de cacao, and cream. Ooh, well, yeah. cheers to you! Cheers to that drink. Mm. Did I? Did you hear over here that coffee and bourbon is good? Yes, I did. And hopefully it's keeping me awake because this is a, <laughs> but I like this. I like that this is a long one. Shamir says, hi, we're going crazy over here. <laughs> Let's start out. Rosico. All right. This, this is an incredible one. There's so much to unveil here. There's so much connection to the movies, but let's start overall. What did you think of this story? Um, I really enjoyed this story a lot. Uh, this was one of the first ones. I, I think it's the first story we have where, Bond goes through a betrayal. Mm. Um, and uh, the, I really like the characters, um, especially uh, Columbo. And it, it's it's an action-packed adventure. There's a lot of different things that happen um, in such a short amount of pages. I agree. And to me, it's almost like it is truly a Bond adventure where the other ones are good stories. This he's stepping through. He's meeting different characters one by one. He's discovering things. Um, there's, like you said, there's betrayal. And you're trying to also figure out, like, who is the good guy and who is the bad guy? So it has that whole aspect of intrigue. There's a lot of mystery. 
um, in the story and, and a bit of espionage that happens on both ends, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, have you read this story before? No, this was my first time reading it. So what did you think of, I mean, we'll start with the characters. I mean, Bond's, the version of Bond in this film, what did you think? Um, so I feel like we don't really get to know Bond as much in mm. this story. I feel we get to know M a little bit because yeah. um, we have that dialogue between Bond and M. And I feel that Bond gets kind of shoved into this mission of M saying, okay, well, you have to go because I don't have a choice anymore. Um, but I also think that kind of like the title of the story, Bond kind of just goes with the flow and takes the risk of, you know, address, like with the person that he's with throughout the story and saying, okay, I'm going to take a risk and trust this person. Right. And then, and then the tables turn and now he's in a different position where now he has to put himself at risk again and trust the other character. Yeah. And it's interesting to me how, you know, the whole idea of Columbo and uh, Liesl, you know, that whole relationship there that kind of like transfer through the whole piece. It was really interesting because at first I thought Liesl was going to be a relatively weak character, but I think that there was um, redemption, dare I say? Yeah. Um. Actually, what's really interesting is I was curious and I looked up their names and um, the meaning of Colombo means dove in Italian, and um, Enrico um, means homeowner or king. Mm. So if you actually knew that going into the story, it kind of gives you a hint of of like who is the righteous person in the story. Um, and then when you look at Liesel, um, her name Liesel means it means God's promise. Oh. And then um, her last name Baum it means wives by lives by the tree in German. So when you put the two together, you have Enrico, who is like the sign of God, like the, the heroic, you know, right. and the holy figure. And then with the dove, and then you have Liesl, who is like the olive branch. Wow. You know, and, and like, like going, like, because he sends Liesl to go, you know, interact with Bond and, and try and get him over onto his side. So um, I think that relationship is really interesting in the way that they talk to each other, like how Enrico says, oh, Liesl's going to, you know, Liesl is mad that I've had to do this to try and get you onto my side. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, and and I found out through just, you know, some research, Liesl, I guess, was one of Fleming's ex-girlfriends, which I thought was fascinating, too, of like, I'm wondering how he's writing about this ex-girlfriend. Is it going to be positive? Is it going to be negative? What is that going to look like? Yeah, I think it was pretty positive for the most part. There's, I mean, there was like a lot of mystery. So, I mean, we don't really get to know her that much except for the interactions that she has with Bond. And and I, I actually really like when she says, you know, all men are pigs. And then, and then, but she retracts that. She realizes what yeah. she says. And then she's like, oh, but you're, you're a gentleman pig. Well, there's different levels of pigs. I think right. you and I have always discussed this. You know, there's, there's like David Zaritsky, like really bad pig. And then there's James <laughs> Bond. And then there's like good people. Good people like Shamir. Yeah. Damn it. You know, who's a, who's a good guy, not a pig at all. But, you know, one of the interesting things about this story, the Rosico story is at one point, there is that sort of espionage and Liesl, you know, trying to play different sides. But then when they get to the Columbo uh, conversation, I think it's a little bit more, as soon as he befriends Columbo and they connect and there's the ship and there's the fighting, it's almost like here in the TV show, because this was supposed to be a TVO, TV show, this is where I'm going to serve up the action. That's what I've kind of felt with this story. What about you? Yeah, yeah I definitely felt that just... Um that moment <clears throat> where they get to the ship and Bond has to do his espionage work to confirm, you know, that Christados is really the bad guy. And then all of the explosions that happen afterwards is fantastic, you know, and the, the um, excitement of the car, like trying to take off and, and everything. Yeah. Now like, you, you've been a fan of the Bond franchise for a long time. Rasiko, this story had to have connection to the films. What connections did you see to the to the films? Yeah, so a lot of there's a lot of stuff from the book or from the story in the film. Um, so ma mainly the characters with Crisados and Colombo, um, and we also have Liesel, 
And um, there's some of the scenes, like the very beginning where they have the dinner scene um, with Christados and Bond and and the um, whole flurry of things that happen with the tables and stuff. And then to find out that there was a recorder, you know, and that was used in the movie as well, which, which I really liked. Yeah. Um, and then the whole um, argument that happens with Columbo and Liesl at that scene too. Like I, I, I liked the, that they put that in the movie as well. Um, and like the beach chase and um, that one is really good. And then, um, and then Columbo giving the gun to Bond, you know, to kind of make amends as they're getting ready for taking over there. I mean, there's quite a lot. I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> it's so many. That's why, um, you know, when we were talking about obviously some of the other discussions with the films, this one out of most of the stories, I think they borrowed so heavily from you've got these major characters, you've got the beach scenes, um, which I, I just, I think that they, they brought a lot because this one has a lot to unfold here. Yeah. And the, and the locations as well. This is great. Create Channel says the raid on the ship and warehouse was incredible. Bond taking control, but then also slipping and falling, getting in front of himself covered in black ink and swearing loudly. So, right, it showed the, the heroic aspect, but the fallibility at the same time. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Create Channel also says, I realize you would never get that in an Ian uh, production. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things that I think that um, kind of don't hold a candle to actually making it into the movie. By the way, do you know any of the background of what inspired Fleming to write this particular one? Um, I knew about the ex-girlfriend, and I think Columbo is based off of a real person, right? Yeah, I think it was, um, I'm going to say it all wrong, uh, Giochino Colombo, who was a, uh, the Ferrari engine designer. He was okay. literally, he designed the Ferrari engine. But I think a lot of this, and you can see it kind of in, in the inspiration, a lot of this was he holidayed with his wife, Anne, in 1958 to Venice. And they went to this peninsula. And a part of this was he's a huge, huge admirer of um, of death in Venice. And so he wanted to take some of the trappings of this, the location and the backdrop, the cafe aspect, and some of the, uh, let's call it some of the flavor of that and basically build a story around it. And I think the ship thing to me feels the most like movie-esque. Even before we saw Free Eyes Only in the ship scene, to me, that feels like a movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that one, I, I really liked. Um, and even in the film, that that whole battle is really exciting. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. Do you? And and by the way, this is this is an important conversation to talk about Fleming because, as John Riggs says, notice all the best Bond films are always the ones that have the most Fleming material. Do you agree with that? Um, I think so. I think um, when Eon takes all the stuff from the books, you know, it. I, I think it really accentuates the movie and and especially for the people who are fans of the books you know like they have that aha moment of like i know where that's from um and i think that makes the movie more enjoyable when we have the knowledge behind all of that yeah agreed and uh, timothy dalton even said it was a great interview with him uh before the living daylights and he said he went back and he read all the flemings and he said because it's all there everything you need to know about james bond is in the Fleming. And I say this with most of these, these book clubs. The reason why we go back to Fleming is not just because they're good reads or because of James Bond, but if you really want to understand the movies and understand kind of the, the inspiration behind all these things, you got to go back to the basics. I mean, when I, when I read this story and then I actually went back and watched uh, For Your Eyes Only, it, it's not a movie that I typically put on. Um, so it made me appreciate the movie a lot more um, and and being like, oh, OK, I recognize where this is from and I recognize ah. where this is from. And um, and especially the characters, too. I really liked the development, you know, and. Um, where was I going with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I love, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question that you just brought up. Did you okay. wind up watching the film after you read the story? Yes, I did. Yeah. What did you think of the you know, was one better than the other? 
Um, so I really liked what they did with Liesel's character. Like, I'm not too thrilled about how she ends up being the prize at the end. Um, well, I, I wouldn't think you would be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so I think what they did for her in the movie was a lot, it had a lot more impact of, like, well, I mean, they, you know, they run her over and they kill her off, and it's it's a terrible thing for her, you know, to happen, but I feel like having yeah. that emotional connection of, like, oh my god, that was a terrible thing, and that's so, so horrible, um, makes it more exciting for the movie than it would of, like, here, here she is as the prize, you know, and go have fun. Yeah, that was a bit of an ooky moment. I kind of prepare myself for what I call those ooky moments of 1950s <laughs> style of, of writing. Um, it's sign of the times, historical, yes. But, you know, Liesl being given as a prize and, you know, uh, him saying, I don't think she'll argue that much. But but at least we notice those things and that's, that's part of it. Um, Nicholas has a really great point. And I want to talk about it a little bit with you because you're, you're a – you're a student of this stuff too. But he says, I feel like we need more of Bond just out. Just, you know, at cafes, casinos, sort of just enjoying things on his own. The flavor of it helps sell Bond's taste and sets the mood. And I would agree with Nicholas and go one step further. Not only is it my favorite parts of the book, especially where Fleming gets descriptive, it is my favorite part of the movies. Because I find when movie, when when script writers, when, when they write a script, and they go back to Fleming and they go, what is so different about James Bond versus Ethan Hunt's Mission Impossible? It is the lifestyle. It is the fact he's sitting in a cafe, eating some delicious olives, drinking the drink that you have or cashews. You know, it is all those different trappings, which to some people are like, come on, move it. Let's get to the ship and explode things. And it's like, thanks. We'll leave that up to Michael Bay. But with James Bond, we want something different. We want those moments because I think we empathize with those moments. What do you think? Yeah, um, I think that's one of the things I love a lot about the Fleming books is the description of food and, and locale. And when we get to see Bond not be on a mission and just be a normal human being, um, I think that's really interesting because we can relate to it. We can have those moments of like relaxing in a cafe and and taking in, you know, the food and drink. Um, I end up learning a lot about food and drink. I mean, I had never had an Alexandra, yes. you know, um, before this. Like, I've had a Negroni and and um, and then just references to to these places. Uh, I'm not sure if some of these places are actually real, but you know, and in his other books, like um, like in Diamonds Are Forever, um, he goes to that one place, and and I've been there, you know. So. It, I mean, kind of like what Melanie was saying earlier about like referencing these places that are real. It's like um, we can go and travel and and experience that and be in that moment of like where if Fleming was there, like what he was feeling and and how he puts that onto paper. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. And it helps us to explore because we get curious. You know, Bond is a connoisseur of good taste, and and I think this one especially this story really does show that. I mean, him sitting out and just enjoying life or connecting with life in everything that he does. And it makes us very curious. Uh, for example, I'm sure I've had bourbon and coffee before, but ice cold bourbon and coffee, I highly recommend it. It's really good. Really good. <laughs> and Dress to Kill Pod says, yes, love the lifestyle. And I think, you know, think about the 1950s audience reading these books. I mean, this again, this this anthology came out in 1960 where people weren't as traveled as you and I. They just couldn't. It wasn't it was luxurious to get on an airplane. So, this was a way to transport people to to exotic places, have incredible drinks like the one you're drinking. And I, I just I think that's part of the magic of Fleming. Yeah, um I think it was really interesting, like, at the beginning, at the dinner scene, they're talking about, like, Tagliatelle, you know, and, um, like, ham and prosciutto, and, and I don't think prosciutto was a thing here. I mean, now it is, you know, you could totally go at yeah. melon prosciutto, and it's, and it's delicious, um, and it really transports you, like, I could, I could imagine myself being in that scene, you know, in the restaurant with all of the drinks and food. <laughs> Absolutely. Look at look at Alex Lamas, Martinis, Girls, and Guns. That should be your tagline. How dare you? By the way, quick question. Uh, Billion Dollar Man asks, what age did David start to like Bond? Um, I, I, am a, I am a psychiatrist dream that it was in the, my main connection with my father when I was young. 
you know, he was a successful entrepreneur, didn't take me out in the backyard, but Bond films we watched together. So everything you're encountering is probably some psychiatrist's dream, I'm sure. All right, Jocelyn, I'm going to ask you a tough question now. I'm sorry. Oh, no. I really like you too, but <laughs> I got to do it. Yeah. So you read the whole anthology. You read all the stories. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how does your story, Rasiko, rate compared to the other ones? Is there another story that you like better and why? Mm. Mm. I'm going to have an olive while you think. <laughs> That's a really hard one. I feel each story has something to give. Yes. Um, yeah. And but get one, nasty. So in terms of action, I really liked the action in this story. Like it, you know, just the way it ends, it's it's a big bang and and that's a lot of fun. Um I think this it's this or for your eyes only, those are my top two. And um the next one that's coming up after this, I actually really like that one too. So I don't know. It's kind of hard to pick one that. <laughs> it's it's like picking your children, right? I mean, it's yeah. not fair. I know. I know I had to do it, but <laughs> it's it's crazy. So I want to ask one other thing to you while I have you, but you'll probably come back in the end. So, but while I have, it's just you and I. So there is a very conscious reason. I think it was clear um, that I picked uh, the amount of, female fans for this anthology. And I thought this book, these stories, have some of the most powerful representations that Fleming wrote. By the way, powerfully flawed, but power powerfully heroic. And I wanted to really, you know, I really wanted to connect those together. Ladies Who Bond, your channel, let's talk about that for a moment in relationship to this book, because I think this book does something very similar to your channel and you do something very similar to this book. What is your channel about? So my channel, it originally started as a fan channel of just um, being a female fan of the James Bond franchise and getting, just sharing that with the world. And um, I also began to realize that there wasn't enough representation of female fans there. And so what I wanted to do is like what I, my mission now is kind of to try and help um, other female fans connect with each other and just let people know that there's a presence here, that it's okay. Um, the community is a safe place to be. Everyone is super, super nice. And um, it's a great fandom to be in. And so I just kind of, you know, share a little bit of this and a little bit of that, a little bit of the, like the fashion and the clothing ID. Like there's a ton of women's clothing, you know, and style that's out there. Um, that the guys don't know about, you know, and just kind of celebrating all of the other stuff. I mean, like the Bond world is so diverse, like might as well celebrate all of it. Exactly. And I love the fact that, you know, I think I've always said that Bond is multidimensional and it's not about gender. It's, it's about people celebrating it. So I love that you said that. Um, it's been fantastic. So I'll tell you what. We are going to put you uh, wonderfully back into the green room to enjoy libations. We've got some snacks in there. We've got can of peas. I mean, literally a can of peas. Um, but we're going to have you back for the afterglow, yes? Yes, I'll be here. All right, cool, because we've got some interesting discussions. So thanks, Jocelyn. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Woo! All right, how's everybody doing out there in La La Land? You're probably doing pretty good. And uh, I'm going to take some water. I need to hydrate. Hmm. Everybody needs to hydrate. Please, if you're having an adult libation, hydrate. I'm going to have some of my cashews. By the way, they're not just any cashews. There's plain cashews and there's coconut crusted cashews. Daniel came back from Trader Joe's with these coconut cashews. And this is not an ad. We're not sponsored by Trader Joe's yet. Um, they're just delicious. I need a snack every now and then. I have trouble just drinking without snacks. David, we're just analyzing the roots of Bond fandom. Yes. Well, you know what it is? I just think Bond fandom is so, I'm just going to use the word again, dimensional. You know, I love the fact, I don't dislike the fact that people say, you got Dalton all wrong, David, or, you know, how dare you, you know, hate V to a kill? Because 
that means someone is passionate out there. That means somebody has an actual opinion about something. Um, you know, we're all kind of addicts in a way, some more than others. Our next guest is such an addict of James Bond. He's going to love this segue. It's going to be like, dude, really? Addict? You had to go there? Um, but he's also British. He's addicted to Bond. So sometime at some point, he's like, what could I name my channel? What could I name my Instagram channel? I'm a pretty creative guy. I'm a really creative guy. I do some really cool imagery. What could I possibly? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, British Bond addict. I think he I think he did a great job. So without further further ado, Chris, welcome to the show. Good evening. How are you doing? <laughs> You're gonna kill me later for that. Like, I do really as soon as you said addict, I was like, I know exactly where he's going with this. I now regret putting it here because it might have seemed a bit a little bit strange otherwise. I, I love that though, because <clears throat> this way people can find you. Hmm. Yeah, well, a, a year ago I wasn't in this game whatsoever. And yeah, kicked into it. And now less than a year later, I'm here <laughs> doing this. So thank you very much. So I'm gonna I wanna play uh David observes things real quick. First of all, you look very no time to die tonight. Is oh, that on purpose? You. Uh completely unintentional. Well, I've kind of got to watch that semi looks like it. So I guess but, we should go for that. But do you do you have the Tommy Bahamas shirt on? You look like you have that shirt. Uh no, this is just a um a regular black shirt. No. <laughs> see, but this is what happens when, when you're addicted to bond. You see like a Tootsie roll everywhere. It's like <laughs> uh, this is crazy. And the other thing I observe is you must be a huge Dalton fan. Um, actually, no. I've picked Dalton for something that's coming up in a little bit. I am a I am a big Dalton fan, of course. He's third favorite Bond overall, I think. He's related to the story, and I've picked up this picture from a very nice friend who um, uh, actually got me these pictures from Pinewood uh, before they changed the 007 set. So I've got four of these. Uh, one's uh, the picture that, may, uh, that Mel was talking about, about Grace Jones with the man over her head. So depending on the event, I'll put out a certain picture that's you know right for the occasion. <laughs> My gosh, you and uh, Elma, you 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 redecorate your whole background. I'm I'm so lazy. This is like all you're going to get. Well, I think I've got a proper man cave with all the posters, but if I do that, you can't really see anything. So I try and bring as much of it here as I can. So this is what I could do for today's effort. You've got a you've got a video room and you've got a man cave. Um, this is kind of the study. I live with some PhD oh. students, so they need to do a lot of work, and I've hijacked it for the evening because this is just as important. Um, Did you tell them to keep it down? Yes, I know mean, they're absolutely keeping it down. No one's going anywhere near the Wi-Fi tonight, believe me. Yeah, I was going to say that and the fact that PH students, they they, they really know how to party. you got to yeah, watch that. absolutely. <laughs> On that note, shall I introduce you to what I'm drinking today? <laughs> uh, yes. Right, well, I've got. we talked about this yesterday on your Instagram. I've got two. I've got, first of all, my favorite cocktail, which is a grasshopper. It's lovely. It's fantastic. It's bright. And it's kind of like dessert. And I was thinking because we're, we're kind of the dessert of the, the book chat. I thought it was I, I could I could literally read by that drink. It's so bright. Yeah, I know, right? It's great. I'm getting a bit of a glow on it. If I'm, I think I'm turning out a bit green. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It, and what is, what is the what's the components of that drink? Um, it's green creme de la month. It's uh, creme de cocoa, which mixes it together. Then you have a little bit of single uh, cream in there. Mix it all up and with chocolate on top. It's really it's like mint chocolate chip ice cream, the alcoholic drink. Oh my gosh, it sounds like a great second drink. I don't know if it would be my first one, but it sounds almost like a dessert drink. I've been on some cider tonight instead. I've now moved on to this. So more than two of these and oh, by the end. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your backup drink? Well, that's the thing. I've got another drink. Um, and I'll, I'll bring it up now. Um, I'm always interested by what we see in the books. And at one point, uh, Crest drinks something called a bull shot or also called mm. a bloody bull. Uh, I looked into this and I realized it's quite a terrifying combination. It's basically beef broth and vodka. Oh, no, no. So no, I thought no, I'd get no. some beef broth and vodka. And I don't know. Like, he drinks it. He seems <sighs> to have a good time with it. I've not tried it. I imagine it's going to be very salty. But this is dedication to the book, right? Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually really happy with you. Shamir has got a good point. You could have gone red wine. You could have gone beer. There's so yeah. many different things in this next story, but, but I have to tell you, you and I are commiserating a little bit because I think I made mention to you, there was a drink I was going to do the Negroni or the Americano. Yeah. I tasted yeah. my wife's uh, drink last night and I was like, I can't enjoy that for three hours. It's it's not a taste for me particularly either. I think it's Martini Rosso or Campari that's in it, and it just doesn't sit well with me. I'm much it's more Campari. Sweet. It's so bitter. The gin I don't mind, but it's the the Campari and even the sweet vermouth. I'm not a vermouth fan, but the yeah. the the coffee and bourbon at a steel flask. 
I do feel like Bond. I feel like yeah. the fire, water, and coffee is doing the trick. And after two hours, you're holding up particularly well, too. So well I'm done. doing okay, right? <laughs> I haven't lost the energy. No, you're still going. <laughs> we'll see you after 30 minutes with you. Oh, uh, <laughs> Chris, mm -hmm. let us talk about the Hildebrandt rarity. But I'll tell you what, before you get into because I want to hear first what you thought of the story overall. But this is a very divisive story. The people mm -hmm. I've been talking about since we, we announced doing this book club, I've had people say everything from I hated it to I loved it to it's my favorite to it's my least favorite. Yeah. Where do you fall in this? Um, it's possibly one of my favorite pieces of Fleming writing altogether. So the fact oh. I've been able to talk about this is fantastic. And I've got an opportunity to defend myself because I feel like Hildebrand's been dragged through the mud a bit this evening. I've got an opportunity to cut in there. So I'm quite happy about that. Go for it, man. You got the stage. Well, for me personally, Hildebrand is two massively different stories. Uh, I think if we go through face value first, obviously it's quite an intricate tale about a really awful person called Milton Crest, um, who's an abuser. He's kind of essentially tax dodging, you know, manipulating the system. And he has an encounter with Bond. And Bond is currently off work. Um, he is between jobs, essentially, waiting to go home. And even though we've had Bond off duty in Quantum and at a few times in the book series so far, like Goldfinger, um, this is where he's off duty and it's actually more of his perspective. So I find it quite interesting from that outlay. You get some amazing description of the Seychelles, which obviously Fleming knows very well. I mean, his, his descriptive writing in this book is completely on point. Um, and yeah, we it goes into this weird kind of murder mystery who done it, and you never really know. And we know Fleming was being experimental. Um, Quantum of Solace was the other experimental piece for um, mm. oh, somebody Somerset. I've forgotten his name. Whoops. Um, but this one was a bit of a change. And I think there's a really deep subplot, which some people might not have picked up about this. And I've been discussing with a few people because lots of people see, oh, it's kind of a murder mystery. It's not an easy read for certain people. Absolutely. I completely understand that the contents of this story are pretty horrific. Um, but from that by itself, it's entertaining. And the first time I read this, gosh, 10 years ago? Uh, yeah, I was, yeah, I was 17. The first yeah. time I read this 10 years ago, I only saw that side of it and I still loved it then. I thought it was a nice way to end the story, a nice, interesting whodunit. And then I started to dig a little bit deeper. But before I get to that, I'd love to hear what you think. You know, I I love it. I mean, I do. And, and I'll tell you why I came away loving it is because, first of all, it is squarely a Bond story. Bond is very active during it. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the most action oriented, but it doesn't need to be. But to mm -hmm. me, I felt Fleming. And I know yeah. I'm, I'm getting kind of like, I'm not trying to get spiritual with this stuff, but mm -hmm. In the, in the stories, in the novels that I hear and feel Fleming's inspiration, I love those the most. Yeah. I was feeling with all of these stories, what was lacking for me were some of the tropes of the novels. Number yes. one, some of the lifestyle moments I thought were kind of conjugated. But the biggest one were villains. Mm. Villains weren't really delved into. Milton Crest yeah. is a loathsome character that Fleming describes like good old Fleming. And because of that, you not only hate this character, you're not only rooting for Bond, you know, jibing him and things like that. When it comes to the ending, you really don't care who killed him. Yeah, You have an inkling, but you mm. just wanted him dead. I hate to yeah. be like that. What do you the think? I'm interesting. Normally Fleming to show that a villain is truly a villain. He gives him some sort of disfiguration. Crest is so bad. He doesn't bother. He's, if anything, a, a mildly fit bloke for his late 50s. He's muscly build. He's trying to be strong. He's yeah. not got the Hugo Drax uh, face melting off. He's not trying to make himself gold like Goldfinger. He's not got no hands like Dr. No. He's just That's a great point. Uh, he's just an awful human. And it doesn't need anything else to say that. His actions speak that alone. Well, it's it, the only defect that possibly Fleming gave from his point of view is that he's American. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> Which that, some would call a defect. Apologies. That, that's the interesting thing. That's that's one of the things that's going to come to it. I'll come up to in a little bit when we go about the uh, the subtext of this story. So that's kind of your overall, and I, I would agree with you. I'd love to know also um, people in uh, <laughs> Alex Lamas. Crest is the worst of all American stereotypes, all in one. Yes, mm -hmm. he is bombastically that. Um, but uh, you know, Fleming talks in superlatives. And Roland, mm -hmm. if you, Roland, who's a writer, is still on here, he would understand this. Some of the best writer villains are almost like, you know, <laughs> they're, yeah. they're superlative versions. They're not subtle versions. And I yeah. think that's what was happening here. John Riggs says there's no debate that Fleming created some of the most loathsome villains in all literature. And I think Milton Kress, out of all the villains, 
even Hammerstein and all those other ones in this anthology stands out as a really good one. Um, it's because it's, I feel like it's because it's at a domestic level. It's something we can actually think about. We can't, we can't really compare a, a character to Hugo Drax who's trying to destroy somebody of a Moonraker craft. We can't imagine like Julius No, who got shot in the wrong side of his heart, essentially. Yeah. I, but this I, is something I totally that we can agree. experience and we can all understand quite how significant this guy's crimes are, essentially. And that gives us another level of, another level of understanding. And I think that's why everyone is so against him, because you can imagine this. And because unfortunately, I regret to say it, it does happen. Um, it does. And there's a really good comment in here that, of course, I lost because the comments are going so quickly. <laughs> but um, one of the things that somebody said was, you really feel, there it is. I got you. Uh, Ken Bauman says, Bond held back to hurting Crest a few times. I felt maybe more than any other story in this one, I felt so much despising of Crest that I felt like Bond. I was like, Bond, look at you being all, all disciplined and controlling. And that must have been hard. But what did you what did you think of Bond as the character? Discipline, 007, discipline. Discipline. Um, I think my favorite quote for that is just saying is when George, uh, Bond judged the um, distance to his solar plexus. One sentence, bam, you know exactly what he's feeling. Fleming at peak Fleming territory there. Uh, Bond is interesting. And this is where I'm going to go a little bit deeper, if that's okay with you. Please, do it. I'm going to have an olive. So we know you were saying earlier that you want to have, you love the Fleming moments, okay? And we think that Quantum of Solace was Fleming really getting something off his chest. Mm. That was Fleming getting something off his chest in a um, relationship way. I think here this is him getting something off his chest in a Fleming way. I think there's actually a huge sort of reveal here from how Fleming feels about a certain thing. And of course, he uses Bond to display himself, as we know through the books. And interestingly, saying this as the Brit talking to an American, I think the main thing, this story is UK versus US, and it's a mm. real thing about the Brits, or this Brit in particular, not really being a big fan of the Americans. Now, as we go through the entire thing, we have a nice, interesting bit of morality uh, from Bond. We talk about how he's able to kill the uh, man, uh, the Stingray, um, Mano well Mano, and that's right. absolutely fine. He's a bit hypocritical, but doing it one-to-one, -one, respecting the creature, possibly eating it afterwards, having a purpose is absolutely fine. Then when he's talking about Crest, Bond says one very important line, which is, I feel like the bomb aimer and Nagasaki. Now, this is deep territory. Yeah. But then, of course, we see mass genocide, essentially. And while at the time, Second World War, dreadful. Absolutely. We don't need to go into that. Right. After 10 years or so, or after 15, uh, well, yeah, 15 at this point, uh, 1960, morality has started to seep in a little bit. And I think Fleming has started to feel that, too. And throughout the entire time, the British Empire is crumbling. We know this. Fleming... Bats on, bangs on about it all the time. He constantly going about how Britain is becoming a small, naked little island, reference for everyone there. And I think he sets up this strange, petty America versus Britain setup. Hmm. Basically, Bond is, he's, he's, he kills in the right way. He does the right thing. He's quite calm. He keeps the thoughts to himself. Then we have, as somebody wrote earlier, the most over-the-top uh, stereotype of an American person ever. So much so, it's almost farcical. Even so, to the stage where he's American, but also a German. So again, the British war thing coming up there too, coming into it. Germans do that at your foot or your throat, all that yeah. jazz. And as it goes through, all the morality issues really come through and we see Bond as a Brit failing to save the day. Twice in this book, twice in this anthology so far. Yeah. Uh, sorry, three times in this anthology so far, we've had the woman killing, essentially. We've had it in Three Eyes Only. We've had it um, in View to a Kill. We've technically had it in Quantum of Solace because, as you guys said, he kind of she kills him and breaks apart his character. Mm -hmm. And here, there's a big suggestion that actually Liz is the person who kills Crest at the end. Now, yeah. we don't actually know, but that links in as well. And Bond is unable to save the day. He compares himself to Sir Galahad, who should be riding in and rescuing the dame. But as Britain is crumbling... Bond can't do that anymore. And right. it's all starting to come to a head. So the only way Bond can win is some weird, petty, moral victory over killing some fish. And Fleming at this point, seven books in, seven uh, seven books in after seven years, he's really getting fed up with the series. He's asked people, to, he's, he sent an email, an, e an email? He sent a telegram, a text uh, saying, um, if, uh, if anybody's got any ideas, even if it includes the kitchen sink, please throw it at me. I think he's been so disenfranchised with not only Bond, but the Americans, it just comes through in this piece of writing. And when you see it that way, all the things start to become incredibly clear. And By the way, I, I got to tell you, the, the chat room is going nuts. But it, <laughs> basically, the sentiment is what Money Petty is saying, which is 
great insights and wow, triple exclamation point. Dude, you went deep. Mm. I love this. I thought you were going to be like, I like what Bond shoes are. No, I, I knew you were going to be bigger than that. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody yeah. felt this. Look, everybody was, you know, oh, I, you know, the Milton Crest hold up a mirror to you. But I think that's a really good point because there have been, I find with Fleming's novels, the ones that I've revisited in this book club, he wanes. You know, there are some times where he really embraces the Americans. There are some times where he really says they're wearing sack suits, you know, yeah. and, and they look horrible and they're brash individuals like like Milton Kress. So this is this is one of those times. You notice a trend that my dad said about this. So shout out to dad because I know he's watching. Um, basically, he says that Bond loves hardware America. When he goes to American Diamonds mm. Off, he loves everything there. Of course, we have a few people who he likes. We have Ernest, the cab driver, all that jazz. Um, but then as it goes on, it's the Americans he dislikes. And even in Dim Diamonds Are Forever, we're still seeing some hugely stereotypical Americans. That a cowboy hat and dual pistols? Really? <laughs> Ian? It's hardware America he likes. He loves talking about the uh, the cars there. He loves going to all the places. He loves the oxygen mask in Diamonds Are Forever. Like a spy. Would you go and breathe something in an airport, James? And then when it comes to the people, we see such such a, a thing here that really just brings out. And Crest is the culmination of it. Crest is all of Hemming's fate towards America, and it's shown in such a way that it's awfully one-sided. It's terrible, but knowing Fleming, that's how he writes. And I think the one thing that really stands this out, this was published in Playboy. This was the first British spy story in an American magazine. What yeah. a story to publish first. Well, and think about the time. I mean, this wasn't the 70s where people were trying to be anarchists, you know, or rebel. This right. was this was the early 60s, my gosh. And, you know, late, late, late 50s, where people were really about conforming, especially America. So for number one, for Playboy to be brave enough to put something in there, and yeah. you would think people would walk away in the United States reading Playboy. I hear there are articles, by the way, in Playboy. I'm not sure. Um and reading that article and going, oh, Fleming sucks. You know, I'll yeah. never, you know, he, it's jingoism. It's yeah. jingoism. I, you know, he hates the United States. His books became more and more popular after being published in Playboy. Uh, that and, of course, we had JFK who said From Russia Blood was one of his favorites. So, and all, and the, But that was a little bit later, but yes. Yeah, of course, totally. of course, absolutely. Um, and something I find interesting is that Fleming tries to cut to the American heart quite well. Like, uh, you know, everyone knows Ernest Hemingway, right? Bond is described as the man, the old, the old man in the sea. And F Bond later describes him, uh, Crest, sorry, as a wannabe Hemingway hero. Bond is already there by accident, and Crest is trying to be that person. Now, for a really tenuous film link, which I've set up in License to Kill, when Timothy Dalton gives up his weapons, he calls it A Call to Arms, a book by Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> Very good. Very good. By the way, I'm going to do something. I'm going to insert it right in the middle, but we're going to come back to the book. Okay. Just because you brought that up, did you notice, did you pick up, did you find Waldo any moments of the book story into films and back again? Mm -hmm. We've had a course, we have a course of references to License to Kill, which is why I put Tim up behind me. That's it. That way. There you go. Why I put Tim up behind me. Um, yes, we've got the corrector. We've got Milton Crest. We've got the Crest, the Crest Foundation. We've got the Wave Crest. All of those things coming in. We also have a really tiny one from the Craig era. Inspector, uh, Daniel Craig, and of course, all the people from MI6 hide out in the Hildebrand Rarities and Antiques safe house. I thought that was a cute one. <laughs> that was brilliant. I, I remember that sort of thing. I was watching it in the cinema and going... Yeah, I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Do you think, I, I'd love to know your opinion on this, and I haven't even thought about this until now. You, you said it with all the Americanisms. Do you think Milton Kress was written in License to Kill to be kind of like a, a very loathsome character? Uh, just, you know, kind of this guy with a boat that just you just dislike. In License to Kill, he's a sleaze, in my opinion. He comes across as sleazy. He's a he's a henchman. He gets the kind of secondary roles. He thinks he's better than he is. When he barges, barges in, he's like, oh, that's on a lady. Uh, he's kind of... It's, By the way, you did the eyeball perfect. That kind of wink he does. Or... It's not quite comic relief, but he's down, he's down a level of severity from where he would be in reality. And of course, against Sanchez, it's going to happen. That, I, that makes sense. Um, but then... When it gets to the book, it's a completely different character, I feel. They have similar similar traits, but I saw I had a completely different vision of Crest in my in the book than I did from watching uh, License to Kill. But I do appreciate the crossovers. 
Yeah, I do too. And by the way, a couple people are saying, like Create Channel, Milton Crest wants to look like Hemingway and sounds like Humphrey Bogart. Fleming is really taking the piss out of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, you have to agree with that. Oh, absolutely. Fleming is, it's, Fleming has been quite subtle before, and we have some more subtleties in this. For example, when um, he goes onto the boat for the first time and we see the flowers, the um, hyacinth. Blue is a hyacinth uh, that's related to sporting and being a sportsman. Mm. And white is I'll pray for you, which, of course, has got to be about Liz. So we get those subtleties there. And then we get just the most brutal, over-the-top description of this American oaf, frankly. And I, it's weird. Fleming, I'm surprised... I'm surprised he didn't have more respect for himself to write Milton Crest as a bit more of a subtle character. Because when you look at it with that eye, it's incredibly obvious that Ian Fleming is just really ranting on the Americans in this one. And while I think he, while I think the story is entertaining, it does undervalue it slightly. Uh, when you're thinking, it, it says himself, Bond says his actions would be petty. He says he'd be, right. um, he's a, a bit childish. Fleming's being exactly that in this. It's, it's such an interesting little story in itself and it's such an interesting way to perceive it. I, I agree. So, all right. So we've got to talk about something that I felt when I read this. And, I, and, and I'm going to say I felt it as opposed to observed it. There are so many stories, especially for a, a gentleman that lived in, in Jamaica in the 50s, in the 40s and 50s. He was a, a man that loved to conserve nature. He was yeah. all about nature, keeping it as, and that's why Goldeneye is not a mansion. You know, it's a one level, tiny abode actually, but everything else was something that he wanted to flourish. To me, having this villain, so villainous that he would pour poison to destroy everything, to me was probably to Fleming as villainous an act as dropping a rocket on London. Yeah, And exactly. I really think that was Fleming's moment of like, you know, saying, save the earth. <laughs> That's the thing. There's a huge thing about conversation, uh, con 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 conservationism in this. Thank you. Um, there's one bit as well. That he describes the fish as uh, trying, to, trying to escape from death, essentially. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that, there's an entire thing about the fish and being related to humans in this. I mean, at the beginning, he says that fish scream when they die. And then we have the whole moral issue about him not being able to accept what's happening around them. We see the fish writhing. We see, as he describes, communities, people, his men, his friends. He doesn't say friends, but he's, he close enough goes there. And he goes into such detail that obviously the writing, the, his writing provides empathy. You get so close to this fish is that you can't help but think it. Yeah. And he does it. He does his Fleming description so well in this. You can't help but picture exactly what it's like to be snorkeling in the Seychelles when you're reading this. And yeah, that's such an interesting issue that he brings up. And it's one that he persists throughout the entire book. And then of course, dovetailing it so that the fish is essentially what kills him in the end. Obviously the little guy getting his own back. Uh, again, look into Britain, and America, whatever you want to there. Um, all of this coming through, it's such an interesting perspective of Fleming as a converse, as a conservationist that this whole idea, this genocide is comparable to humans. Like he's yeah. doing it the entire time. He's comparing them to his friends. His At one point he calls him the fish should survive, his fish, because he saved it. And Fidel Barbie calls him out and he said, dude, the fish is what on earth are you going on about? And <laughs> it's so interesting and so strange. And it's just top Fleming. It's just top Fleming because it's it raises so many questions and when Fleming's on his bowl, it starts conversations. Yeah. And again, this is why I think this is one of the best villains of this an anthology. I mean, even as as Chris Schofield says, no one's thoughts on Crest's corrector. I mean, what the actual F? You know, yeah. So here he's taken something from nature, you know, yeah. and he's he's made it into this whip, this punisher that just makes her obviously blanch. I mean, yeah. it's just so horrific. I, I, it's very effective to paint the villain in that color. It's very effective, and it's an incredible way to subvert expectation from the beginning. Because, of course, we think about nature being absolutely fine, and then to see nature being hung up in a different way and used uh, against somebody who's very natural. Uh, Liz Crest doesn't wear uh, lacquer on her fingernails. Uh, she doesn't wear lipstick. She is as nature intended, not trying to be preachy here. To, to have an alien figure use nature against nature, surely that's a that, that must be some sort of considerable crime there. Right. And to have it used so frequently, I mean, Bond touches it and it hurts by itself, it's illegal. But then strangely, we get into the hypocrisy again, because after Bond's brought in the stingray at the beginning, Fidel says, oh, do you want to keep the tail? And instead of saying, no, that's against nature, no, that's terrible, he says, I don't have a wife. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So where is Bond Ugh. standing here? Surely right. he should be against this from the beginning. It's all it's illegal. He goes on the entire time about how bad it is. Why doesn't he not express it? But yes, I think a good point. I'm I'm afraid I, I missed who made the comment. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the corrector is awful. I, it's awful. A, it's and, just, and they brought it back in the movie. That was another similarity where you know they have that kind of yeah. brought back and and the the threat of it as well as the use of it too. Exactly. And I feel like it wasn't. It, it didn't get enough presence in the film. I'm not saying I want to see more of it, obviously, but it's not, it doesn't be, it's not as despicable as it is. It's not shown to be as despicable as it is in the book. You really just get a hatred for him wielding it, let alone using it. And by the end of the book, when you hear him using it, yeah. I mean, I would like to see a single person who would not wanted to have at least punched Crest in the, fresh, uh, in the, in the face whilst reading that bit, let alone what actually happens. A couple it's, things in the chat I've got to tell you. First of all, John Riggs wants me to tell you, uh, but you can let him do it. The observations by Chris are excellent. Oh. <laughs> There'll be no living with Chris at this point. David, tell me is lots of fans in the chat. Um, some guy named Being James Bond says, boy, that's a great insight. Well said. Um, and it, it goes on and on. So clearly you've done your homework, but I think, I think a part of this is brought out because you're very passionate about this. Um, have you always read the Fleming books with this type of analysis or is this kind of a little reborn? Um, first of all, thank you to everyone in the chat. That's uh, made my day. Uh, honestly, hearing that, like, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um, I used to talk about this, uh, this talking about this sort of stuff with friends a year ago, but like, yeah, Chris, we get it, whatever. Now I've actually got people who want to hear it and it's, yeah, it's fantastic. So thank you. Um, uh, for me personally, I've taken a bit more of an insight recently. Um, I read all the books, uh, read most of the books uh, a while ago. And of course, rereading them for the Fleming Reading Challenge, I've been reading with quite a few people in the community. And quite a few of them have opened my eyes to a little bit more insight. When it comes to something like Quantum, uh, not Quantum, sorry, uh, Hildebrand, you can't help but think of it. When it comes to Quantum, you can't help but think of it. For your eyes only, a little bit different. So it mm. depends on the book uh, for me personally. I like to look with an inquisitive eye and um, I like to look at the, the meaning of flowers behind it, the meaning of animals uh, in this in this one especially. But there's sometimes you read Fleming and you can just see that there is a different intention there. And we definitely had it with the earlier five books. From, from Dr. No to Goldfinger, we were starting to lose it, I feel. We had a bit more clandestine stories. I like Dr. No, I really like Dr. No. I'm not a big fan of Goldfinger. But then to have this again shows that Fleming still had it and that you still need to keep an eye open. It still needs to be there. Yeah. Uh, gosh, great points. And by the way, it's interesting how we entered this conversation. So Hildebrandt Rarity gets a little bit of a uh, little flack, you know, a little, little maybe not so love uh, type moments. But I dare say your analysis has probably turned some people around. So let me throw out two questions for you, since I'm going to, you're, you're flexing your creative and, and, and uh, analytical muscles here. Um, number one, when you take a look at License to Kill as a film, and you take a look at Hildebrandt Rarity as a story, it's always unfair to compare them. However, if you had to, which of the two are more satisfying? Ooh. Ooh. That's a fantastic question. Well done. Um, well, you, satisfying, you can look in many different ways. Uh, as an overall story with a significant ending and a bit of beginning, middle, and end, I'm probably going to go with the film uh, because you have the entire arc, you have the satisfying ending, you have the redemption, you have the revenge, you have the references to live and let die, just there. Um, but with the book, it's not satisfying because you don't get to know the ending. Now, for me personally, I think all three of them did it. You can argue that it might have been Liz, it might have been Fidel, but no one would have gotten away with it if they hadn't all worked together. They conspired to sleep in by accident. They mm. are all working together. And let's face it, I think, and I've talked to quite a few people, the majority of people think Liz did it. Yeah. Fidel was the one who's saying, oh, it's okay, can we, get it? we can get away with it. I, I've got my some friends in the force, it's fine. And Bond helped do it. That's literally the hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. There we go. We've got those three there. So instead of focusing on one, we have three instead. Does that make it any more satisfying? Not for me personally, because I just want to read a little bit more, which means that this is just so well written. The fact I'm thinking that just shows that this is a well written book for me. That's phenomenal and really well said. And so I'm going to ask you the somewhat psychological question that I asked everybody else. I hope you're prepared for it. And that is, I assume... And maybe you haven't, but I hope you have. And I think you have. Have you read all the other stories in the anthology? Yes. Yes, I have. Wonderful. You can play the game. Um, 
when you take Hildebrand Rarity and compare it to the other ones, um, is it number one still, or is there another one out there that just kind of tweaks your fancy? Um, something, I'm going to go on a bit of a rant here. Something I've discovered since joining this fandom properly last year, because I've been a fan of Bond since as long as I can remember. I've never had a moment without Bond in my entire life. Something I've realized is that you can learn to appreciate things in more than one way. And I used to be very one-sided. I used to be like, okay, this is what I like. Anything different, I'm not going to like. I've now recently learned that actually the Roger Moore films are some, are some silly fun. They're good. They're enjoyable. Actually, let's look at those that way. Uh, let's look at the Craig films, a bit more serious. I can take those too. Mix it all into one pot. Don't compare them against each other, but actually just compare it as a whole. Now, of course, personal favourites, you do have your favourite coming through, and it is Hildebrand for me. But to compare Hildebrand Rarity and For Your Eyes Only, they're two completely different subjects. And mm. while I will say, yes, it is my favourite, it's my favourite by far, the rest of the book is so well done that it's just an enjoyable read. And to sit down and enjoy something surely is what should be the purpose. And for me personally, I enjoyed every story in this book. I enjoyed it massively. I do have my favorites, but I'm going to take back the fact this was all just good for me. And that's what I'm going to sit with. The the one thing I, I, I continue to find fascinating is the two stories that are truly about relationships, relationships gone wrong. Yeah. And the karma, the comeuppance of those have been motivated by Blanche Blackwell. Ian Fleming's friend slash lover. Um, yeah. Because this one, if you do some of the homework, which you probably have done, this was an experience that they had, um, you know, heading to uh, Bombay, but they, the, all of these things really kind of transpired. So it's interesting how he, he really uses those things that the people that were important in his life, he likes to take a megaphone to them. And that's, that's a part of his writing. Well, uh, something I read about the um, the Andrew Ly the Andrew Lysett biography of Fleming, by the way, which is worth a read. Um, there's a significant moment where Fleming, we know, had a bit of a made uh, masochist, sadist relationship with his wife. We know it came through. And when it comes to events, obviously, like we had on the boat, but things like the whip coming in, for example, you see it being turned in a slightly different way. And there's a moment where even Bond doesn't walk into the closed doors behind man and wife and the whip that's what's happening. That almost comes through as Fleming trying to like justify him and his wife, Anne Charteris, about it, because he constantly brings up saying, oh, he was always defending himself against his friends at the time uh, when it happened. And in the book, even James Bond doesn't go to that level. Even James Bond doesn't do it. So surely me, Ian Fleming, can. And when you see it that way, it all really pieces together in a very strange way. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Chris, thank you so much for bringing such an amazing analysis. I think uh, everybody's pretty wowed. Thank you for taking it so seriously. And I, I do believe you're staying for the afterglow. Absolutely. Well, this is this, this is my Saturday night now. I've, I've got to do this. And I want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity. This has been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure. My pleasure. Now they're going to all force me to put you back on again. This is what happened with Melanie. It's very embarrassing. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll see you in that. We'll see you just in a bit. And for everybody else, here's exactly what we're going to do. It is 527. We are going to take a three-minute break, German three. We're going to take a three-minute break for those of you who are 53 years old and need to use the bathroom or whatever you want to do. You can fix another drink. And we're going to come back at 530 for the next part of the discussion. Talk amongst yourselves. We'll see you then.
Thank goodness for uh, Dr. Lisa Funnel for telling me that I was mute. It's amazing these little signs, but I do, I do feel so much more comfortable. That's too much information, but you needed to know that. Uh, the reason why we have this next session is very simple. I was curious, and I think you're going to be a part of my curiosity of, it's wonderful that each one of these co-hosts talked about their own individual stories, but what about cross-pollination? What happens if we get all of these co-hosts together to talk about the individual stories, even briefly, because I'm sure there were other observations that were made. This is where also I want the chat room to be really active, asking questions, giving comments. We're going to serve it up. We're going to try to bring it all together. Maybe you had time to refresh your drink. Maybe you didn't. But let's start to add everybody back in here. Let's get the party started. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey, gang. There we go. Hello. Hello. All right. You know what? Before it was a discussion. Now it's a party. Isn't it party now? <laughs> it is. <laughs> Does everybody still have libations? Cheers. Mine is a lot lower. <laughs> All right. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. First of all, everybody in the chat room, please give a round of applause for these amazing co-hosts. The preparation, the analysis, the forethought, un- Believable. I am so lucky. This is like stone soup. There's a story called stone soup where a guy brings a stone and everybody else brings everything else to the table. I'm the stone. This is what brought the flavor, these people right here. But let's let's go backwards for a bit because all of you had to sit there and just bite your lips as people were talking about maybe something really important in one of the other stories. This is everybody's opportunity to cross pollinate and talk about the story. So let's start with a view to a kill. And Melanie, you could still play along. Oh. But for those of you that didn't cover a view to a kill, what did you like? What did you dislike? And observations, things that made you mad, things that made you happy. By the way, everybody is applauding. So <laughs> many applause. <laughs> Going on. And A View to a Kill is a great one to start our cross-pollination, given all of the bees around our rows here. <laughs> nice. Well done. I, love it. I didn't see that. Very good. <laughs> Who wants to jump in first? I, well, I actually, A View to a Kill and Quantum were my top two that I was teetering between because... Um, I hadn't read it in a long time, but I just kind of peeked at the first few pages um, to see which one I wanted to tackle. And A View to a Kill is so gripping right from the page one, right from the start. I'm like, oh, a girl on a motorcycle. There's all this stuff happening. And it's like really adventurous. I was like, that might be the one. But then I ended up going with Quantum. So I'm, I'm happy that you got to talk about that one. It was really nice. And Alma, it's so funny that you mentioned that because I think great minds uh, think alike. <laughs> I was I was also really debating when David asked. I was like, I don't know because they are those are the two that I tend to I I, I felt like um, have some of the best discussions surrounding them. Sure. It's it's quantum's an interesting story. I can't wait to start talking about that. So I'm just going to zip my lip for a minute. <laughs> Yay! I can't wait to hear what other people have to th you know say about it. But I love that because I was debating between the two as well. So awesome. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Jocelyn, a view to a kill. What did uh, what did you do? Yay, nay? Um, I think it sits in the middle for me. Like, it, I think it was a great starter, like to really get you mm. into the novel. Um, there's quite a bit of imagery, like for me, that I could not stop thinking about when I was reading the book, and I kind of told Melanie about this actually. Um, just when now that we've kind of been reading these books, you know, for the Fleming Reading Challenge, and we're looking at them with such a critical eye, like some of the imagery that happens with Fleming is kind of like the sexualized imagery and stuff like that. And the thing with the rose, so you have the rose and then you have the periscope and then the idea of like the base that comes out and the doors opening, like I almost took that a little, maybe a little bit too far, but like the imagery of a woman's mound, so to speak, and like penetrating and like doing all of the action. And then I was like, okay, I, I, I cannot stop thinking about that now that having read this, but I can't. It's like a George O'Keefe moment. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I've taken it too far, you know, but I was like, I don't know if that was intentional or not. Like, where do we draw that line of analysis? But this is, <laughs> I, I so, so love these type of discussions because when Jocelyn and I discussed this, that she had mentioned, I did not walk away from this at all with that. 
So that's why it's so great to bounce these things because uh, you're reading from different perspectives. Everyone has their own ideas. You're interpreting these symbols differently. This is what I love about this group. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I didn't get that either, but now I can't not get that. <laughs> um, George O'Keefe, eat your, eat your heart out. Lisa, where did, uh, where did A View to a Kill fall for you? It's near the top. It's probably number two for me. Again, I like things that are action oriented. I, as I said, you know, I found a lot of connections between Bond being a hunter and, and sitting perched and being aware of nature and, and literally outweighing the, 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 the people that he was tracking, right? Sitting there and being patient. And when we think about bodily patience, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to sit in one spot and not move and then have nature naturalize around you. Yeah. And so I thought that that was an interesting balance to the like the tech side, the idea of driving and riding in a, in a car. And then just all, all of the stuff that happened, whether it was the first guy uh, recognizing the type of car and so slowing down, like who could this be? And just the the thoughtfulness that went into the the entire plan, and then Bond going through that same process, and then having to act in the moment. I just thought that there was an interesting balance of like nature and technology, and Bond being able to be an expert in both spheres at the same time, and and that's what makes him super heroic to me. I think that's really extremely observant, uh, Chris. I'm going to have you react to a comment actually for yours. So Create Channel says. Don't want to come down on a view to a kill, just found it uh, a bit long and was not as enthralled even through the imagery was thrilling. And we respect all opinions here. That's just who we are. But Chris, what do you think? Too long, too labor intensive? Um, I think it's just a perfect length for me. Um, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of tainted from the fact that I like quite a bit of 1960s and 1970s TV. And I swear, this was just a Saint episode for me. I could see all of this being absolutely oh. the same. Maybe even the department S, maybe even, um, um, oh gosh, Persuaded, something like that, something along yes. those lines. I couldn't help but see it as soon as I saw that. And you've got the, it's, for me, this one is the most TV pilotable episode. It's got a significant mi mi yeah, uh, beginning, middle, and end. I could see when the advert breaks would be in this episode. I could see when they'd be the black and when you come back afterwards and be like, and now, back on, a few to a kill. Um, I could see all of that in real detail. And I think the fact it's long helps provide the tension. I mean, mm. if you just if you just throw in, okay, here's a bike scene, here's this, here's a bike scene again, you'd be, oh, mm. It builds up the tension, it ramps it up. And for what is a basically a very small showdown, Bond and two people, because you've had the tension and then the reveal of Russell, so much better because you've had her story going through the entire time, the her kind of fluctuating, waving about. When it's her that's at the end, it seems cliched now, having the like having the the one that we talked about a little bit comes back and saves the day. It seems a bit cliched. At the time, I would have loved to have read this in the 60s. And I really get the feeling that had I read it at that point, this would have been brand new. So yeah. I think I, I'm afraid I have to disagree with Create Channel. I'm really sorry. I don't want to be that guy, but I think it was perfect length for me. He hates you now. Hates you. I said, no, <laughs> it's fine. It's a, All of no, it. it's by the All way, the this is this is what can you imagine us being a community of automatons all thinking and, and saying the same thing? Yawn. No, this is great. And I've always said that, especially with Fleming you get out of it kind of what you bring, you know, your own experiences. Martin, for example, I, I think this is fascinating. Martin Barrett um, says, I love the motorbike chase. The BSA bike of the time looked like a beautiful machine. He's clearly knows what the heck a BSA bike looks like. So he was able to take that nugget and blow it out. And, and Chris, it's similar with you. I think you, you bring your own impact moments to the table and put it through that filter and you get your own type of enjoyment out of it. Exactly. You, you find you find the enjoyment that you're looking for sometimes, and sometimes yeah. you, sometimes it's unexpected. Sometimes you have to find it a little bit. Sometimes you have to dig, and the digging always seems to be fun. Yeah, and it's it's through our eyes. And speaking of eyes, uh, we've got to talk about Lisa's. There'll be no good segues. They'll all be horrible and groan worthy. So ten out of ten. They'll be. I was, I was impressed. Just Look, folks, there. coffee and bourbon. All right, it's not, it's not good for press. <laughs> But for your eyes only, Lisa's for your eyes only. But let's start with Melanie. Melanie, what did you think oh, of for your eyes only? I love this story. I loved absolutely it. You're, love. loved it. Wow. Oh, I do. This is in this collection. Uh, as even though uh, I mentioned earlier, like Elma, I really gravitated toward quantum as far as being a good uh, discussion, as far as enjoyment. I. For your eyes only is 
is at the top. It's it's a fantastic story. Uh, some of the things that I wanted to mention that weren't mentioned earlier is I really, really loved the um, mention when uh, Bond throws out, he has never suffered a personal loss. Mm -hmm. I felt really gave us the answer to a big question from Casino Royale, the first book. Was he really that broken up over Vesper? Did he really love her? And I feel like we got our answer here. Mm -hmm. Ooh. <laughs> wow. What does everybody else think of that? I'd, I'd love to hear. <laughs> I, I, that was my takeaway from it. I got my answer through this short story. For me personally, it was he's not suffered a, a, a great loss because I don't think he's accepted it yet. We At the end of Casino, the bitch is dead. Done. That's it. We never really comes to terms with it on a proper level. And I think that's just shelved away in a part of Bond's subconscious that's never truly going to come out. So, yes, he's not suffered a personal loss because he's not putting himself there. That's what I picked up from it. That could I, be. I read it more as like he I think the, the the terms that he used, he said I like something like I've never suffered a personal loss. And I don't know if he used wife and children in that. Hmm. And so I was sort of trying to read and try to figure out if if with Casino Royale, for instance, you know, he didn't marry Vesper. So maybe he was just aligning it with with that. But I think you raise a really, really good point of like, how yeah. deep is your love? How deep? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> how do I even know? <laughs> right? But I mean, there, there's loss that happens across. So. Or is he like you would imagine assassin needs to be where he compartmentalizes mm -hmm. each event in his life because how would you go to sleep at night killing all those people and and doing all those things without you know putting those away in a box bury that one and then you open a new one i don't know elma what do you think are we getting deep here oh exactly i mean i agree with all of you guys i don't know what more i can add but yeah it is about compartmentalizing and I, there's even a moment in quantum when the governor says um you've never been married or like i uh which i wasn't sure if majesties came before or after but there's these moments where he mentions like things like that right and you're like oh yeah how's it how does it actually affect bond but um but yeah i <laughs> did, did you point, like David. this did you like this short story Oh yeah, this was the yeah. other one that I was thinking about, but um, because I love the character of Judy, and um, and I, you know, I if you can tie anything back to the movies, it's always fun to like analyze it and stuff like that. Which my story didn't have any of that, so um, <laughs> it it's fun to read um, for your eyes only as well. I really like that one. Jocelyn, did you did you love it? Did you have to push your way through this story? How did you feel about it? I really enjoyed this story a lot. Um, I, the story of Judy at the very beginning, it's very emotional. Um, and mm -hmm. I think some of it too is that that you can relate to it. The idea of someone coming into your property and just like mass killing your parents and all that stuff. Like I, I felt, you know, emotions and was it's a little bit scary and terrifying. And But then the fact that she gets to have her revenge and she works her way through it, it's like, it's an amazing, like, emo like all of these emotions that you feel with her um, is pretty phenomenon, phenomenal. And so um, I really like that aspect of the story. And then with Bond kind of traveling through and doing all these things, doing it for M, you know, and and then the whole interaction between Canada, like, we don't see anything. Um, I, I think that was really interesting, too, like a different part of espionage that we don't we don't get to see. Yeah, I agree. And I like... <laughs> Lisa, you 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 probably brought this up, but I I have to say, after reading this short story, I I think I like Judy better than the movie version. I I don't think that she's a heroine in distress. I don't think she needs Bond. I I think she's just you know an equal. I don't know. I am I grasping at things here? What do you think? No, I, I think she's written in that way. I think you know you have to give credit where credit is due and. Fleming wrote her to be an autonomous figure who's seeking out personal revenge. Now she happens to interact with Bond and he, he offers her the backup, which is the flip of what he wanted to do. But I always thought that she had a mission and it was a personal mission and she accomplished it. Um, and there were no strings attached to that agreement, right? right. Their choice to, to walk off and, and go to a motel after is, is, is on them. But I always felt as though 
the movie version, I, I always I always read her as being more childlike and more daughter-like mm. to Roger Moore. And I didn't necessarily feel that dynamic here until maybe even the very end, right? Where Bond was trying to shield her and push her away. Whereas with this, Bond just wanted to do it. And she yeah. was like, no, I'm doing it. Yeah, and they did. They did it her way. By the way, Elisa, <laughs> I've got to be honest with you. We've had it. This has been such a great chat room. I, I haven't. Everybody's just been so kind and so nice. Um, we've had our first insult, and it's uh, Ken Bauman who says, "Laugh out loud." The Bond theme singers are safe. <laughs> now, listen, I can. I don't mind you directing that at me, but if that's at Lisa, that's just <laughs> okay. I mean, it's you know, okay. and, and Ken, I don't even have a quantum of solace for you at this point. Uh, you can, uh, <laughs> no, but speaking of that, we have to go to Elma's. Before, wait, before we go to quantum, though. Thank I, you, because that was a horrible other, segue. I, I wanted to bring this up because it was something that Chris had mentioned since we're coming right off of Hildebrand. Uh, Chris had mentioned the whole thing about sportsmanship and, you know, the, the whole thing with the fish and uh, killing them with poison and such. And uh, this was one of my key takeaways in this particular story. And being a bird lover myself mm -hmm. uh, was when the kingfisher bird is shot and how Bond reacts to that. And, you know, again, this sort of harkens back to uh, live and let die when the pelican is shot. And Bond is infuriated over that because it's so unsportsmanlike. If the bird isn't doing anything wrong, it's it's for no purpose other than just senselessly killing. And mm -hmm. Bond does not like to senselessly kill. Yeah, yeah he has morals. Like so. he has a moral code of some sort. And he knows that his job is his job. And he'll kill people and face death and all of that all the time. But yeah, like you said, senseless killing is crossing the line for him. I find that Fleming in all his books, but especially these stories, always ties nature with death. And the Gleaner has a really great point. He says that scene where the hummingbird hovers over Mrs. Havelock's dead body and an mm -hmm. imaginary Mrs. Havelock talks to her daughter is a great piece of writing. Yeah. And there is that, Melanie, it's such a good point, that correlation of you know nature to death, to people, to characters and back again. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I have to think he did this purposely. Something, something I really enjoy. I love the idea that they kill, uh, you see the guys killing the kingfish and it's killing nature. I saw, um, I saw her as nature herself and nature fights back immediately. And nature kills in a much more destructive way than what we saw. And I like how it's, it's almost immediate. We have it at the beginning, we have the kingfish, we have all that jazz, obviously. But then when we see it in person, when nature is observing that thing happening, Nature fights back and fights back with extreme accuracy. Straight away, one shot, that's it, done. Nature's done its course. You have Bond, of course, afterwards, and as you guys mentioned earlier, isn't it particularly accurate? But when nature's the driving force behind it, and it's the same with, uh, the same with Dr. No, something like that, similar. I love how it's kind of weaved through, and that one struck out to me massively. Good points. And no pithy segue, because I tried that. <laughs> uh, Quantum of Solace. And, and, and Chris, since you're warmed up, we're going to work backwards. There's actually a rhyme and reason to this. What did you think of uh, this story? Quantum of Solace, I, again, we, uh, you guys mentioned it earlier, Fleming getting something off his chest. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, he did. Um, I find it very interesting that we see this. Uh, that's not only that we hear this story, but Fleming gives it such importance that it's the middle part of the book. That's Hey, you, we've all we've all been in the middle part of a book, and that's make or break, right? We've all been there. It's taken a bit of a pitch change. We might, you know, drop it if it's not going to work. The fact he has such faith in this story, and he considered it so important that he put it there, I think is incredible. Like, I feel like the order of books in this series is the order of the stories in this series is intentional, and I think there's a very personal reason as to why Fleming put it in the middle, and I think it's because this resonated so strongly with him. And when you hear the story about how it all breaks down, how the, when the house gets split in half, when it all comes together, I really feel Fleming was actually writing in quite a sympathetic way, which we don't see in Hildebrand. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just the positioning of that story kind of really cements something to me. And I really appreciate it being there. Yeah, it's a great point. Lisa, um, Elma and I got into some deep stuff. I don't know if we meant to, but we did. What did you think about, well, I mean, the, the takeaways were, you know, obviously that there are not only parables, but the whole fact that revenge, although seems sweet, um, mm -hmm. is sometimes a dish served cold to both people. Um, I mean, what did you think about this story with that? 
it's an interesting story because I'm not a big fan of the story, but I can Honest. see okay. the value. Again, I'm very more action oriented. If I'm going to read a Bond story, I want there to be Bond-esque stuff in my story rather than him being a listener of a parable of a story um, and finding value. Like that's where I fall on it. Um, but I think revenge is an interesting topic. And I, it's hard because I read this as when people are hurt and when people hurt each other. And I think we've all either been there or know people like relationships can be incredibly destru destructive, destructive for the self and destructive for the other. And so you have love, which is a very intense emotion and you have the end of love, which is also a very intense emotion and people yeah. can be very vindictive in it. Um, and I think that to me was my takeaway is this is an example of the moral of the story is you can lose yourself by taking that revenge too far. Um, and, and I think they both changed because of it. Did they change for the better or the worse? I'm not too sure. Yeah. Those are, but those are really good points. And I loved how Elma referred to it as almost a palate cleanser. You know, it comes squarely mm -hmm. in the middle and, you know, Jocelyn, as you were reading this, you had two stories under your belt and you were coming up to this one and you finished it. What were some of your takeaways? Um, so this story kind of felt like an intermission. You know, mm. when people talk, I was looking at people in the chat and they were trying to rank these stories. And uh, how do you evaluate ranking the story? Because it's it's not necessarily a Bond story. It's Bond observing a story. So it's almost like a story within a story type of situation. Mm. Um, and I, I think for me, the one big takeaway is that at the very beginning, you know, Bond sees this person and... And then the story gets told, and then at the end he realizes that that person was, was, um, her, you know. And and you can't really judge a book by its cover. Like she seemed like such a boring person at the end, you know. And but yet through the whole story, she goes through this whole story arc of like, of meeting the guy, and then you know, the you know the whole thing. And yeah, I, I think that's kind of interesting. You really can't judge people for who they are and what you see, like until you really get to know them. To do it, to do an arc, to use your words, in thirty pages of, of two characters, I think I think that's a lot. Um, Melanie, I'm sure you have no opinion about this <laughs> whatsoever, but go ahead. Well, I I know we have a lot of movie buffs in the chat, hmm. and although this was, I I know we referenced. Uh, yes, the title was used, uh, you know, in the follow up, the second Craig movie, but. I feel like uh, for some of us who might be a little bit older, we've actually seen this movie with Kathleen Turner and Michael Douglas. It's called <laughs> the Roses. The Roses. <laughs> oh yeah, War of the Roses. And going back, this is typical War of the Roses. You know, uh, no one ends up winning in the end. Yeah, uh, it is. It is a very tragic tale. And uh, I, I know definitely when I when I first read this and you get to the end of the story. What, what are your takeaways from this? It's so hard. It's so hard to, to really kind of put together. I, yes, I feel a degree of sympathy for Rhoda at the same time, you know, you also feel sympathy for, for Philip because he didn't deserve that either. And just, I think in the end, it's just, nobody wins. It's just such a tragic tale. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so happy you brought up War of the Roses. I, in my brain, I was trying to think while I was reading it, like, where have I seen this? What movie is this? It's <laughs> it's a common story, you know, but I couldn't really peg it. And that is the perfect, actually, companion to this. Yeah. And, and then also, Jocelyn, what you said is exactly what I forgot to mention, that twist of you know, how he finds out that um, that Rhoda was actually sitting next to him the entire time. And that's, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. That's the great thing about this story also the governor and bond both disliked each other when they met or like they didn't have any interest in each other they didn't think you know he thought he was at this boring dinner party wasn't expecting anything and then gets enthralled in this story that the governor starts telling and it really has an effect on him so it's a nice story of two strangers meeting that thought seemed you know that seemed like they didn't have anything in common and then yeah. share this moment together and i imagine kind of like in grand budapest hotel um you know when they're sitting at this dinner and being told the story and they had no idea um who that guy was that um that you know who happened to be zero and i'm just imagining bond in that setting you know like being told the story by a stranger which i thought would be cool in a movie too 
So Elma, I, I, I've got a question for you because I'm, I'm imagining your journey, but I don't have to imagine it because you could just tell me. Uh, of you, you do this, you read Quantum of Solace, you prepare your notes, and then you immediately jump into Rosico, which is like going from Downton Abbey to Mission Impossible Fallout. <laughs> yeah, it's like they're they're so different, and yeah. one is quiet, relaxed, and bombastic. So I'm going to have you kick off. Rosico, what did, what did you think of this story coming after yours? I also love, I just love the premise of this story of um, the smugglers and, but I can't help it. Every time I read Columbo on the page, I'm just picturing Peter Falk. <laughs> Uh, excuse, excuse me. Uh, yeah, one more question. One more, one more question. Yeah, yeah. yeah but um, but I I love the story. Um, it's um, you know, and again, I'm like calling a lot of it back to um, the parts in the movie, but it it's painted beautifully the picture and and yeah, it's like my story was sandwiched between these two adventure things. And it just picks right back up. You're like, okay, back into Bond, back into action. Let's keep reading this thing. And it moves the whole book along. And I I actually, I like, I, I think it's a perfect follow-up. I, I agree. I, Jocelyn, you use the word intermission, that the last one was like an intermission. Intermission's over. You got your new popcorn. You went to the bathroom. You feel great. And you're back for this. What do you feel about this story as you come back? Uh, it's a lot of adventure and action. Um, there's so much stuff going on in the story, like from the traveling and the, and the libations and food, and then the people that he interacts with, like, I think of all the stories, I really enjoyed the characters in the story a lot, like, cause you really get to be involved with them and the conversation that Bond has with them. Like, I think, you know, the conversation with like Cristados is like one kind of thing and, and, um, Bond is still evaluating Cristados, and then when he gets to meet Columbo, he doesn't think highly of Columbo. Like he's almost like, "Oh my God, what did I do wrong? Like, who are you?" and and whatnot. And then to learn that Columbo is actually the good the good figure in this story, you know, and then having to reassess all of it. And I'm I'm impressed that he's put all of this stuff, plus the drug, you know, um, the drug smuggling, and um, you know. All of it into like 30 pages. I'm I'm thoroughly impressed. Yeah. Like I almost want a whole novel out of this story alone. Sure. A lot of people, Melanie mentioned that earlier. You know, there, there's it's so interesting how some of these could be novels. To me, I get it that he was writing for television. So he you do with television, you have to create a beginning, middle, and an end, a resolution, conflict, all these different themes so quickly. And I think maybe that's why it's so satisfying. Maybe more people should write short stories like television shows with all those themes. Um, but Lisa, you're, you're back in action. Your <laughs> warrior woman is back in action. And, uh, you know, is it, is it, you know, what, how does it sit with you, this one? It's interesting because you're saying that, and I'm just reflecting on some of the comments from before about one thing that I found was a thread through the first three was this emphasis on, I don't want to just say diplomacy, but the way that a spy mm. has to act in various spaces. So whether you are meeting generals, whether you're meeting diplomat, di other diplomatic people, diplomats. Yes, yeah, so diplomats is the word. Sorry, we're we're making our way through. Um, but even when you're meeting different spies and you're in different places, right? It's those moments of having to be malleable and mm. and to to sort of reach out and and try to make connections, even with people you don't want to make connections with. Yeah. And so I think that's something with this story that I also was now thinking of, not necessarily the action stuff, because we've talked about that, but the fact that he's going into different spaces. Now he has to cultivate a new relationship. Now he has to gauge whether his cover is kind of intact. And then the person leaves the table. So what does that mean for him? And we get to see his thought process in these moments of trying to observe, but also respond and constantly assessing and reassessing. And this is probably the story where he's constantly doing that. He is more in flux than he seems more certain and, and, and more direct in a lot of the other ones. So I kind of like that fact that he's constantly reflecting and reacting and trying to assess, okay, so who's, so who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? How is this working? Why are these people coming out of the water? There's an explosion over here. What is going on? There's just a lot of stuff being peppered at Bond and he's just bobbing and weaving and making his way forward. And I think that's the enjoyable part for me was the internal struggle with all the actions and changes that are taking place in the external environment. 
Yeah, and I th I think the story, this particular story, out of all of them, he's the most successful. I mean, he's got a lot of failures and mishaps and disconnects. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, you know, what was your takeaway with this though? In the story, um, <clears throat> it's interesting. I read this a while ago, and obviously, I knew um, I, I knew the books overall quite well at this point. Reading this again, it's hard to not see the film in this one. It's really hard to dissect mm. and take it away. It's really hard, and it's also hard to find it and take it from different books. I mean, the running against the beach scene, we kind of see again in Majesty's Secret Service. Spoiler: um, the one thing for me when I read this again this time is that when I read it this time, I realized what I thought this book collection is about, and it's not judging a book by its cover. In every single story, we have a, not, not deception, but we have a subversion of expectations. We have it with Marianne Russell in the first book. We have it with Judy in the second. We have it with Rhoda in the third. We have it with Christatos and, of course, Columbo here switching around. And we have it with whoever killed, um, um, oh gosh, whoever killed Crest at the end. It was when I finished the book this time, I realized that actually there's one big link here. And to have a takeaway like that, I'm pretty happy about. Um, other takeaways I guess I would have from this book was that it was, it was, it was a bit of fun actually, really. It was really yeah. enjoyable reading this. It's, it's one of those things that ends up there's being a page turner. Like, you know, you kind of know where it's going. It's a bit predictable, but it has a great time doing it. And I'm all for that. I, so I'm going to use your terminology because I do think if this was a popcorn adventure, this was the most popcorn adventure out of the book. Oh, yeah. I mean, with the ship and you, you still had a nice beginning and lead up to it, a little bit of intrigue. But uh, to me, I think this one really does hit home. Melanie, what what was uh, what were your thoughts on this one? I know I, we were talking about earlier about how these were written as sort of like television shows, and I feel like no. this would be the two part episode, right? Where you get part way through it, and then all of a sudden you have a cliffhanger and have to wait until next week to figure out what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, that was something that uh, I saw Shamir throw out in the uh, chat, and I 100% agree with that. Um, yeah, it's, it is, it's, it's really great. I love all of the comments that have been provided thus far. Uh, you know, Chris had mentioned how all of this is sort of a don't judge a book by its cover and deception. And one thing that I find really interesting with this, having been this far through all of Fleming's books is this is the first time we are really seeing revenge as a main theme entered into mm. any of Fleming's writings. Mm. That's a good point. And I find that so interesting because in all of the novels up to this point, we haven't seen that. And now we're seeing it laced in all of these short stories as a major theme. So I think that's another sort of takeaway from this as well. There, there are some amazing takeaways. Uh, people like Chris Schofield says, am I right in thinking Bond slips in raw heroin? So by the end of that story, technically Bond's clothes are worth about 1 million quid. Take that, Tom Ford. Uh, people draw all types of conclusions. Um, this this one is phenomenal. But I'll tell you what, I'd love, uh, I'd love Elma to start off the story about a man who gets a fish in his throat, <laughs> Hildebrandt rarity. Now yes. this is, and I, I mentioned to Chris, you know, I gave him fair balance, but he, he wowed me. Um, this is a divisive one. Either people tend to really like it or they don't. Where, where do you fall in this and why? I like this one. And nice. I think it was already taken when I, right. When, when you approached me, so I couldn't, I didn't have any choice. I couldn't pick this one, but I love the, um, the ocean stuff. I love underwater. I'm from Hawaii, so I'm a big snorkeler. And I actually, I was just back home and I was reading this while I was there. So I was reading this on the beach, the water there and thinking about the fish and oh. all the things. And it was just the perfect read for like, you know, on the beach. And I also like talking about nature and Bond's relationship with the nature. And that's really Ian Fleming, you know, cause he, of, um, he loved to snorkel. Right. And so, I love that that's woven into the story. He's, you know, talks about fish getting hurt and how they cry when, when they get hurt <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So um, it shows like that sympathy. And um, I actually really enjoyed this one too. I love how it was personal to you because of where you were brought up. I mean, that's, I, and I keep going back on this. It's like, you know, watching a movie or reading a book, you, you can't help but put it through the filter of your experiences. Right. It's so true. Jocelyn. Um, fish sticks. I mean, what were you mobilized to do after this? What did you, what did you feel? So I, okay. I know I've, I've talked about this with Melanie and I know how she feels about it. You cheated. 
<laughs> um, I I really like this story. It kind of ends on a downer, like it just just the way it, it ends. Um, but it makes me think a lot more about the bigger picture of life mm. and where we are in life. And Whoa. you know, the whole scene about the fish and the poisoning and stuff like that, it makes me reflect on like like when you go hiking in a mountain and then you turn around and you see all of civilization below you you start to think about what greater forces are there above us and how they can impact our lives, you know? So then I end up leaving with more questions and thinking about my, my life and my place in humanity and what we can do to be better people and, and how we interact with people, how we interact with nature and all that stuff. Jocelyn, the That's gravity <laughs> in this live stream just got so much heavier and more profound. That's amazing. Yeah. You <laughs> Seriously, you should write the cliff notes to all of Fleming's books. <laughs> so meaningful, no matter what. Um, Melanie, I'm getting from your body language, and I'm pretty good at body language. You may be in disagreement with your good friend. I know, I know, okay. and I think I think Chris and Jocelyn both have excellent points, mm -hmm. and uh, I love the interpretations of what this is saying about you know nuclear war and. All of I cannot stand the short story. I think, bring it, bring it, bring it. I think this is where probably Lisa and I <laughs> hang out and have a drink together and be like, I want heroic bond. I want action bond. You know, him chilling and having a drink and listening to a story about a, you know, a, a you know, a couple who have a, a horrific falling out is one thing. Okay, but to end on this story, I want the heroic bond. Yep. I, you know, that's that's what I want to leave this book with. I, 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 there's so much about this story that I dislike. Um, I really, you Stop know, Stop sugarcoating it. I know. <laughs> when, when I read it, when when you read it and you leave on this cliffhanger of did did uh, did she do it? Did he do it? Ultimately, it doesn't matter. I feel like the whole poetic justice of him getting killed with the fish, we already saw that. We saw that in Dr. No when he got killed with the bird guano, right? So I feel like this is just a rehash of that. Um, I, I don't, what's interesting to me about this is I don't think the wife killed him. I don't think um, the, uh, the island, I'm trying to remember his name here. I don't think... Thank you. Thank you. I don't think he killed him either. I know that that's not the point. I know it's not important who killed him. I think if anyone were to have actually killed him, it would have been Bond. <laughs> so it just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, the the spousal abuse is just uh, so hard to read. It's yeah. extremely difficult to get through. And knowing the psychology of women who have actually been through that, and I know Chris touched on this as far as you know, he is the worst villain that we will see mm -hmm. in Fleming literature because he is out there. This is very, very real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. However, I also know the psychology of women who have been through that. And you see the codependence there. And it's, it's, it's just such a hard read. And I yeah. hate that it ends on this note. And yes, Fleming, he's getting, he's getting very serious. He is talking... And it just for me though, I don't want that. I want yeah. escapism. I want people, it. people watching this should also know that Melanie's favorite new film is the new Mortal Kombat on HBO Cinemax. So <laughs> she likes oh, a good no. spine pull every now and then. <laughs> no, but you're right. I mean, the it is hard to read. I think that mm -hmm. you know it's those things that people need to recognize. You know, what what is that old saying that Merlin says? Good and evil, there's never one without the other. You need to see the evil to understand. You know, what does good look like? But this is a very, even the critics said about these stories, especially this one, that this was a very mellowed, sober, weary Fleming. Mm -hmm. Many said that he was better mm -hmm. in short story because it was smooth and readable. But mm -hmm. ultimately, some of these things were clearly just Fleming going, you know, here I am. Mm -hmm. And I think, Melanie, you're hitting upon that. So, so Lisa, I've got to ask you a question. You've got Jocelyn here, and you've got Melanie here, and you've got Elma here, and Chris is. Where do you fall on the spectrum? 
Oh, Melanie, Melanie and I are going for drinks. hundred <laughs> percent. Oh. oh my gosh. This was a tough read. I don't, it's very difficult for me again, as somebody who studies this stuff for a living, but it's really difficult to read about this type of, um, intimate partner violence and yeah. to see it put out there. It's just, it's, it's for me, it's just, it's too hard of a read. And when I think about making different premises for stories and vilifying, you know, having somebody be vilified, I don't necessarily want this to be a component part. I think that sexual violence and intimate partner violence are very easy stories. And again, I know where Fleming's writing. I'm just talking about it from 2021, are we in? 2021. Still, yeah, still. <laughs> like, right? How's that it's drink? Just, <laughs> I know, right? Um, but I, it's just something that I've seen so yeah. many times and heard so many times. And, and I will say when I listen to audiobooks, I tend to, I do listen to like thrillers and spy stuff, but I usually listen to it written by women and voiced by women because some of these elements are just just conceptualized in a very different way. They're treated in a different way, in a way that I can actually take it as being more palatable. Um, I did though, when we were talking about animals, just to bring this up, I did find it, like I find Fleming is a little inconsistent. It, it, he'll say something and have a standpoint, but then show us like the same thing, like the opposite. And so like, he's against killing all of these fish, but he has no problem killing the stingray at the beginning for sport, yeah. for pleasure. And he says, well, it's because it could kill me. And it's like, yeah, but you weren't swimming in the water and it was coming at you. And so you had to spear it. Yeah. You went out hunting it. And so like, I do feel as though Fleming definitely presents this impression that, that Bond doesn't, doesn't want to kill animals. And even in a lot of the films, Bond doesn't want to kill animals, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I found that this one was a little bit inconsistent because he did hunt it for sport and then he's like lamenting that he's going to kill all these fish and I'm like yo dude you just killed like the big one like you, you know so Fleming I, had a bad run in with a stingray that that's the only takeaway right there had it's to have like, been something there I love fish but you dude <laughs> the, the, the fact too that of all of the five stories that we've covered here this is the one that runs in playboy that right there. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. As opposed to the other one is in Cosmo. <laughs> no, really. I mean, the the one that uh, we were talking about before of the you know don't get revenge type thing. Yeah, good point. I think the thing I find very interesting about this as well is we have to we have to consider the timings. I mean, first of all, like the fact this is at the end of the book, and after that page, you're meant to hear, da 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 da. -na. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work, does it? Um, it just doesn't fit in at all. And it's really strange, yeah. but the book I have, the copy I've got here is from, it's when the film came out. So it's 1970, uh, 1979. On the blurb, uh, the Times writes it as good, juicy violence, the girls as wild and luscious as ever. That was 1970 what? 1979. Did they actually read the book or have Times changed that drastically that this was considered? <laughs> that was to sell the movie. I, yeah. uh, that's yeah. I I chatted with this with um someone who's got one of the first editions. That's also written on the first edition from the sixties. Mm. That's one of the by, by the way, that was around the same time, and I've I've seen this ad, maybe many of you have. Um Dr. Lisa, maybe you even use it in your classroom. Um, they used to have 007 cologne, and it literally said, You'll be able to kill women with this cologne. <laughs> now, I think they meant slay, which is a <laughs> much better term. <laughs> And I hope that Madison <laughs> Avenue guy got fired, but I still have that ad. It is just, it, it, listen, I'm 53, you know, I get it. You know, I'm, you know, oh, get off my lawn, but that's just weird. That's just uncomfortable. <laughs> that's a hell, it's a hell of a misfit. And that's why I think the thing on the back of this, the fact is that was before the film came out as well. Having that is just such a weird placement. And even regardless of how many years it's been, that's a strange vibe to put on the blurb. Like if you read that, you would not expect what you get at the end of this book. That's mm -hmm. true. All right, Chris. So you're you're fighting for Hildebrandt rarity, is what you're saying? Because mm -hmm. it's a, it's certainly a pure form of entertainment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what can you say after what everybody else has said? Nothing. Get out of the room. Run. I, I understand. I understand. It's been great. I've had a really good time, and I'll, I'll see you all never. <laughs> and that's been Chris. Exactly. <laughs> Listen, we're gonna end this on a really great note. First of all, everybody watching, we are. 15 minutes over, but what does that even mean? We knew this would be a bit nebulous timing wise. I want to thank because three hours and 13 minutes and 53 seconds later, we've got Elma 
we've got Lisa, we've got Chris, Jocelyn, and Melanie, who please understand these things aren't just thrown together. There's communication, there's preparation, there's notes, there's timing. And it's not easy getting in front of, you know, hundreds of people. You know, I say this at the end when it's done, of course. Um, but I want to thank all of my co-hosts. You made this uh, the event that it was. You really did. So thank you very much, truly. Thank you, David. Thank you for us. Yeah. No, you guys are awesome. It's fantastic. Such it was a great. gracious host. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, you, you, it was great. And maybe that's the bourbon and coffee talking. I don't know, but I don't think it is. <laughs> and can you thank you for bringing on so many women. And Chris, first of all, you were brilliant. Um, so, but in addition to that, bringing on so many women and women of color to speak about James Bond, which I think is really important. So, this is a really great platform for women to get their ideas and perspectives forward. We are part of the fandom. We've got a lot of things to say and hopefully these yeah. ideas were very useful for, for those listening. Yeah, Ed, thank you for saying that. And and I said this earlier, but I'll say it again and I'll end it on this too. It's, um, this was no accident. Um, every, whether it's Lisa, whether it's Melanie, whether it's Jocelyn, whether it's Alma and Alana, um, on your <laughs> podcast, I consume these things. You know, First thing in the morning after my coffee or during, is when I listen or watch Bond stuff. And I'm a fan of all of these. It's, uh, I hope this is a mutual admiration club, but um, this was a pleasure. And yes, it was a bit purposeful because of the content, but I would do it on any other subject. And you were all wonderful. Chris, you held your own, you're okay. <laughs> Chris, your hair looks good. That's all I can say. <laughs> That's all I came here to hear, actually. Now I've had that. <laughs> you can go um, to bed now. Something I, something I will, oh, to be fair, I should be doing exactly the same as Justice. That should be me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> something I will say, I do really appreciate, and I've had lots of people communicating with me, that quite a few of the ladies' events, um, like co-organized by um, Dr. Lisa Fennell, Mel, Jocelyn as well, they, and I think I, I think I've been to them as well. I'm not sure because I've not actually been allowed in. Um, I've heard those have been incredibly popular, and the fact you guys are bringing the community so together so well is nothing short of admirable. It's fantastic. And to share this with all of you has been amazing. So thank you. Same, Absolutely. same, same. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks everyone. And by the way, I do need to tell everybody there is some good news to share. And that is the bond book club will return in Thunderball. So we will see everybody then start the reading and we'll talk to you all then. Take care, everyone. <laughs>